on today's show we have a interesting topic so we are going to be talking about marine life and uh, zoology and life under the ocean and i've been waiting for this episode since very very long and we have uh, we are joined by zack today uh, zack is a marine biologist wild zack 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 cole is a marine biologist wildlife filmmaker science communicator from central florida he has worked with variety of wild life in his career including sharks whales monkeys crocodiles penguins lizards snakes and so much more he's worked in aquariums and zoos and far out in the middle of the ocean but now is focusing on creating entertaining wildlife videos in his backyard <laughs> that must be a very um, exotic backyard for <laughs> then um, and also i want to really appreciate zack i'm i'll be dropping his uh, youtube channel and instagram links in the description make sure you visit them because it's a very high quality uh, filled with music animation and humor uh, fun clips and documentary videos on wildlife is really a really good uh filmographer if you may thank you i appreciate uh, it so much so on rock class as you know this is your destination for expanding your mind and igniting your curiosity i am your host tanmay shah i am an artist and an entrepreneur with a diverse uh, business experience uh thanks for tuning in the show this week if you want to support this show uh, you can do so now by becoming a patron uh, you can also collect rock class club nfts uh, which are launching soon and on uh, we are open for advertisements and sponsorship as well so i'll be putting down all the links in the description you can check it out and if you want some dope kickass artworks check out uh, my nfts and i would love to invite you to join my twitter spaces uh, where we held uh, space twitter spaces every week and you can connect with the host too which all the links are being mentioned in the description and uh, yes let's tune in for this exciting episode on wildlife and ocean life so zack how are you doing today i'm doing great it's uh it's about 9:30 in the morning here in florida and uh So you got me bright-eyed and bushy-tailed in the morning and I'm so excited to be here Tammy. Thank you. So excited to have you. Uh let's begin with the beginning. How did you become a marine biologist? Oh man. Um so when I was a kid, uh Jurassic Park came out and I wanted to be a paleontologist. I wanted to go dig in the dirt for dinosaur bones. I thought that'd be the coolest <laughs> job ever. And uh So as like a child I started collecting fossils. Uh and one of the most common fossils here in Florida where I grew up are shark teeth. Uh there are shark teeth everywhere. Um all over the place. You can find them in our rivers, you can find them on our beaches, they're all over the place. And so I started collecting shark teeth and started learning more about sharks and ended up learning that sharks are not only older than the dinosaurs, uh they're still around. Dinosaurs are extinct as we know them. Uh birds are actually dinosaurs, but that's a different topic. Um but sharks are still around and they haven't changed a whole lot in the 400 million years that they've existed in the fossil record. So I started learning more about them and I was like, "Man, I want to study sharks." So I that's what I ended up going to college for. Uh it was for marine biology and studied sharks. Um whenever I graduated, I ended up working with dolphins and whales instead um and that's when i i had a lot of people asking me like so what exactly do you do out in the ocean because it, it was kind of difficult for them to understand and so um i made a video which is the one that you found about working offshore and that's kind of how i got here <laughs> um bit long-winded but that's how i got into marine biology was because of sharks they pulled me in and now you're d- developing interest you're developing interest more in monkeys and zoology as well what about yeah it? yeah so um i with the with the way that the pandemic affected the united states um a lot of the jobs that i was working offshore started to shut down 
Um, I guess nobody wants to be on a boat with a couple infected people <laughs> um, with no escape. So uh, a lot of those industries kind of slowed down. And I had been doing YouTube videos since 2015, um, but I wasn't doing a lot of them. That might be like one or two a year. And I was talking to a friend at the time and they said to me, like, why don't you just focus more on Florida wildlife? Like, there's a ton of cool stuff here. You know all about it. Like, just start showing that. And that was kind of the birth of Wild FL, Wild Florida. Um, and so I rebranded my YouTube channel. We did a Kickstarter to get the, um, the logo trademarked so that way we could sell it for, uh, for merchandising and... And I just started putting out videos and, uh, I've kind of slowed down a little bit, uh, at the end of the last season. And at the end of this month, I start shooting for the next season, uh, which we'll start posting in March. So, um, yeah, there's so much stuff here in Florida. We have, we've got a little bit of everything here. We have crocodiles, we have alligators, we have sharks, we have manatees, um, we have so many different kinds of flamingos. insects. Flamingos, absolutely. The flamingos are slowly coming back to Florida. Uh, they were extinct for a little bit here. Um, we, uh, we Hunters killed them all. Plume hunters uh, killed all the flamingos, and we're starting to see flamingos show up again. They're immigrating um, from the Caribbean back into Florida. When, we, which when is I really hear exciting. about Florida, that's the first thing that comes to my mind, flamingos. Right? Exactly. A lot of people uh, associate Florida with flamingos, and it wasn't until the last few years that we realized that, oh, flamingos do actually live in Florida because they've been gone for so long, historically speaking. Um, we have another really cool bird here called a roseate spoonbill that's also pink. Um, it's much smaller than a flamingo, but a lot of people see it, and because it's pink and it's a bird, they assume it's a flamingo. Um but it's not. We just have two different pink birds here. But uh, flamingos are our biggest mm -hmm. one. I think I have a photo of that. It's. Uh, let me share. The, it's, it's the one from your drive, right? Um, I don't think... Yeah, I've got a photo of a roseate spoonbill in the drive that I sent you. This... Um, yep, pink that's bird. it. That is a that is a roseate spoonbill. So I took that photo down in uh, Everglades National Park, which is at the very bottom of Florida. Um, but that's what they look like. So a lot of people see those and they think that they're flamingos. They're not. Uh, just a very weird. So this is a native uh, native uh, Florida bird. Absolutely, this is a native bird. So, and uh, I'll cover them in a video one day. There's uh, a small breeding population of them here in Orlando, where I live, um, and I'll, I'll get them. I'll get them on film, and I'll do some cool stuff with them. You know, just uh, I just wanted to throw it as a joke, but uh, America is a land of immigrants, right? Um, yeah. Very few natives. So, in the wildlife, how many? wildlife population is immigrant and what is native oh we have we have a lot of we have a lot of really cool native wildlife here um the thing that makes florida a little interesting is that we also have a lot of what we call invasive species um so these are animals that are introduced and aren't from here um but they're able they don't have any predators here sometimes they bring diseases that don't that that mm. affect our native wildlife and our native wildlife doesn't know how to interact with them because our predators that we do have like alligators would look at something um we have uh, an invasive duck species uh, that's from south america um like alligators don't register that as food they don't look at it and say like, oh, it looks like a tasty duck. They say, I don't know what this is and I don't know that I can eat it. Um, we uh. have we have a lot of invasive species here. I don't know the exact number of them, um, but depending on the places, and we have a lot was, of invasive reptiles. It was very interesting to know that uh, you started out hunting for fossils and shark was the fossils that you find most widely. Uh, and you mentioned how old shark is, even older than dinosaurs. Uh, yeah. But I thought oldest creature would be horseshoe crab. How would yeah, you compare so, that with sharks? 
So horseshoe crabs are a, what we call a living fossil. Um, a living fossil. Is living a term fossil. We, yeah, yeah. We use that as a term uh, for an animal that, that in anatomy wise has not changed very much over the course of its history in the fossil record. Um, so for example, um, if we were to look at the fossil record for humans, uh, we can see that in the past, humans looked different from how we do nowadays. Um, we can get into evolution and everything. That's It gets a little bit complicated. Um, but that's how we go back and trace our lineage back to other apes and eventually monkeys, where we sp split off from them. Um, even further back to, to other mammals and even before then. Um, with something like a horseshoe crab, we don't see that in the fossil record with the fossils that we do find of them. They haven't changed a whole lot. Um, the same is also true for sharks. Uh, sharks have not changed very much. Yep, there we go. There's a horseshoe crab right there. So um, horseshoe crabs are very closely related. Even though we call them crabs, they're very closely related to spiders and scorpions. Uh, they don't look like one. Um, they are not dangerous whatsoever. They can't bite you. Um, they do have some spiky bits on their shell that might poke you, but they're not like a stinger. Um, they're totally harmless. Um, some people eat them. Um, I've been told that it tastes like scrambled eggs. Um, and the yeah, blue and blood. Yep. So that is the other thing that we do with horseshoe crabs. Uh, there's uh, a huge uh, prominence in the medical industry with horseshoe crabs. Uh, so in... In mammal blood, the reason that our blood is red is because we have hemoglobin. Uh, horseshoe crabs have copper. Um, uh, it's a, a, oh a copper God. molecule, and that's why their blood looks blue. Um, and so they use it in a bunch of different uh, medical research, as well as treatment for things like cancer. Um, it makes a really good substrate to add other chemicals in. Um, and so they, they milk... They call it milking horseshoe crabs. And the cool thing about this is that you can take some of the blood from a horseshoe crab and then release it back into the wild and it will live totally fine. And then in a few years, you can collect that horseshoe crab again. Um, it's really neat what they do with the horseshoe crabs. It's That's a really good sustainable market to go catch them and bleed them a little bit and then let them go and then mm -hmm. catch them again a few years later. It's like a blood donation from a horseshoe crab. It is. It is. They don't. They don't exactly consent to it, but they. Um, they. They uh, just live the rest of their life crawling around in the sand. Is so, it most? But, are these mostly found in the Americas? So we do have horseshoe crabs. Or is crabs. it all over the world? Yeah, I believe. I believe they're all over the world. I'm most familiar with the Atlantic horseshoe crab, which is one that we have here in Florida, um, all the way up to, into New England. Um, we have them all along the U.S. Atlantic coast. Um, I do believe there is another species in Africa and one in the Indo-Pacific. So there should be one around like Indonesia, uh, New Guinea, Australia, uh, up towards India, Sri Lanka. Uh, I think there's another species there. Um, don't quote me on that, though. <laughs> Don't worry, people will find out. It's uh, yeah. recorded. So, <laughs> I was uh, the way I found this. You was very interesting. I my curiosity took me to searching about uh, whales and s the video. Some videos on sperm whale came along and how they sleep at night um, and they dive so deep. They have this weird head, uh, which is. I mean, which is not related to sperm. Uh, the, the, there's some other thing in there, a uh, nose that is a liquid, which is like sperm, as they said in the video. Mm -hmm. But then that took me to your video, uh, which talked about beak whale. So till then, I thought sperm whales are the animals which dive the deepest. So can you tell us a bit about the beak whales? Yeah, so um, beaked whales are a very unique whale species. Um because we don't really know a whole lot about them. Uh, beaked whales never come close to shore. They live their whole lives way, way, way out, hundreds of thousands of miles out in the middle of the ocean, very far away from anywhere where humans would frequent. Um, they, the only times we really see them are when they get sick and 
they die and then they float to shore. Uh, just a week and a half ago, we had one wash up here in Florida. Um, and a lot of people look at them and they're like, oh, that's a really weird looking dolphin. Um, they're not dolphins. They're their own unique thing. Um, there's not a whole lot known about them. Uh, we know a little bit about their diving habits. Oh, there I am. Um, we know a little bit about their diving habits uh, in that they can dive. Some of them dive as deep as a sperm whale, if not deeper. Um, some of them do not. <laughs> Some of them still dive pretty deep. Uh, the majority of their diet are squid. They mostly eat squid. Um, and they kind of expand their throat, kind of like a, a turkey baster, um, to suck up squid underwater. And that's the only thing they eat. Um, they don't have teeth. Um, they do have teeth. They only have two teeth, but sometimes they don't even erupt out of the gums. Uh, so they their teeth are pretty much useless. Uh, and you don't really need teeth to eat squid if they're just slurping up squid. Um, but yeah, we have, we have that, that record that you have there. We can see that like some species like the Cuvier's beaked whale or the Northern bottlenose beaked whale, they dive deeper than sperm whales, which is crazy because, um, sperm whales are much more well known to science. Um, beaked whales, when they see a human boat, they usually get out. They usually dive down or swim away. Sperm whales don't really care, which is why we know more about sperm whales. Um, mm. And to, to answer your question that you said, it, it is in fact not sperm in their head. It's a, it's a type of fatty fluid that's called spermaceti uh, that just looks like sperm and that's how they get the name. Um, but beaked whales, there's not a whole lot else I can say. We just don't know much about I... them. I have two questions related to these. Uh, first is about how they get seeped on the shores because living so deep in the ocean, I heard, I have seen on that video where the nitrogen bubble happened in the blood and when they try to change the, like when they climb up, I don't know if that's the terminology used, used in the ocean or no, but when they elevate from the depths of the ocean very quickly the mm -hmm. uh, atmospheric pressure changes stuff in their body and blood specifically that's why i guess well, what do you call that phenomena so that is called barotrauma um there's uh they also get um this also happens in humans um we have barotrauma and then there's also a condition that scuba divers get called the bends um the bends is when nitrogen comes out of your blood and forms gaseous bubbles. So normally uh, your red blood cells can actually store nitrogen inside of them. Um, when you come up to the surface too quickly, the change in pressure on your body causes those nitrogen bubbles to come out of your red blood cells. And that can cause a lot of damage to the inside of your body. It can just straight up kill you. Um, it's really, really damaging to humans. Um, it still happens so, to beaked whales. You, I, we can understand about humans. They are non non native ocean species, but uh, these whales they have for generations and millenniums, and they have always been in the ocean. Even mm -hmm. then, why have not they adopted to this, or what causes them to come up so fast? Even they know when they know it's deadly for them. Yeah. So I would say with that, it's a lot of times, why would an animal put itself in danger? Because like, you're right, they've, they've been living there for thousands, millions of years. Um, why would they suddenly change their behavior? And that's a good question that we don't have an exact answer to. Um, there's a few hypotheses onto why. Um, what I personally think is that with the way that human activity is happening in deep water environments, um, we're using sonar much, much deeper than we ever have in the past. Uh, and sonar is really loud. Our ears can hear sonar underwater. Um, there's videos on YouTube of divers uh, hearing it, and it is loud as can be. Um, if you are a beaked whale and you're diving deep down in the ocean where it's so dark that you can't even see, and they are navigating by echolocation, looking for food, 
and then all of a sudden a really loud sound happens. It might scare you, and it might scare you enough to surface a little too quickly. Um, that's what I think is happening, is that it might be something related to human activity. Um, there's also the fact so that don't just... don't you think... So are there reported cases of uh, these whales being washed up on the sea before the sonar technology? I mean, is it only because of humans? Yes. So there, there definitely are cases of pre sonar was invented in world war II. before world war II, there were definitely beaked whales that were washing up. Um, and that goes into something else. And that is eventually animals do get old. They do get sick. Um, and there's also stuff down in the deep ocean that might try to eat them. Uh, there's plenty of other things that might motivate them to mistakenly surface a little too fast. That still happens. I think we're seeing an increase in the frequency of it happening, the amount of beaked whales that we're seeing because of related to human sonar activities. But before then... Not just beak whales. Not just beak whales, but there are like... Uh, beak whales are smaller, but even sperm whales getting washed up and huge mm -hmm. whales which might not have a natural predator, even they right. get washed up, isn't it? Yeah, so uh, two weeks ago here in Florida, we actually had a killer whale wash up on our beach. And that is the first time since 1956 a killer whale has washed up in Florida. Um, I, I mean, like, to call it a once-in-a-lifetime event is not an understatement. Like, this is a once-in-a-lifetime thing that could happen to you. Um, I was in California at the time, and I had a bunch of friends calling me saying, like, did you hear about the killer whale? Uh we have our one of our theme parks here in Florida is called SeaWorld, and they actually have live killer whales on display, and they used to do shows with them, um, and people could kind of get up close to them and see them. Um, they ended up doing the necropsy on them, on that killer whale, uh, on this dead one that washed up on, on a Florida beach. And they ended up determining that it just died of natural causes. It was just an old whale. That's it. Um, so it definitely happens. For sure. Um, the, with Another things like curious sperm question whales. was... Yeah? Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say with other I'm whales like sperm them. whales. Um, with things like <laughs> sperm sorry, whales. They, yeah, yeah. With things like sperm whales, they, um, they, it's a lot of the same stuff. Is that like they might surface too quickly. Sometimes they just get old. It happens in nature. You know, killer whales, uh, they have got this uh, killer name, but still they are in so many aquariums and they do so many shows and are so friendly. So why is that so? Or uh, why, how come are they so tamed here? Or are they like tigers, which we um, have tamed in zoos and circles, but they're not really by nature that... Uh, so I would tameable. say with that, the, the way that killer whales got their name... Um, they were originally called whale killers. Uh, the other name for them was a blackfish. Uh, so back in the days of whaling, uh, a whaling vessel would be killing uh, a big baleen whale, maybe a humpback, a blue whale, a right whale, something like that. And they would notice uh, what they called blackfish or whale killers would show up and start eating their whale. And they'd get very upset at that. Um, oh. They weren't exactly sure what they were, Eventually, we realized that they are not fish, uh, and they are not whale killers, although they do. Instead, they are killer whales. Uh, so killer whales are a member of the dolphin family. Uh, dolphins are a type of whale. They're a very specific kind of whale. Uh, they're a, a toothed whale. And with killer whales, they are what we call the apex predator of the ocean. Uh, an apex predator means that they have no predators. Nothing eats them. Uh, a wolf in the wild could be eaten by a bear or a tiger or something, uh, but a tiger doesn't have anything eating them. They would be an apex predator. Killer whales, it's the exact same thing. Sharks don't mess with them. Other whales don't mess with them. Nothing eats killer whales. They are top of the food chain, like the top of the food chain. Um, so because of that, they also display a, a lot of intelligent behaviors. Um, they have been observed using tools. Uh, they use their own wake in the water to push seals off of icebergs, which is really cool. Um, 
that that's something that is a higher cognitive function than something like what a fish might do. Although there is a fish that uses tools as well, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, What's the name of we, that fish? Fish using uh, it, tools. It's, it, it's called a tusk fish. Uh, they're actually found in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, they take rocks and they bash clams with them. Um, so that's considered tool use. Uh, but with killer whales, they because they they can be captured and they can be kept in captivity, we saw, especially in the 1950s, um, a lot of places started keeping killer whales on display. Uh, that's whenever you have places like SeaWorld pop up, Miami Sea Aquarium. Um, there is a, a large industry all around the world that used to capture killer whales. Um, in the 80s and 90s, it became very unacceptable to do that because the way that they were capturing these whales was really violent. Uh, there's no other way to, to describe it. It was violent. Uh, they were taking killer whale calves and separating them from their mothers because the calves are a lot easier to capture because they're so much smaller. Um, so there is a big ethical question of what does this actually do to the animal's mindset? Does this traumatize them in any way? Um, so with this, we do see in captive situations, killer whales have killed people in the past. Uh, as you far know, as I know, even with elephants, you know, the elephants is the same here in India. Like, uh, I thought they would get, I mean, get a husband, wife, elephant, and then have us, um, like pets, right? Pets, how they do breed the pets and you have another pet. It's mm -hmm. not like that though. They get, of young babies from the wild, they sort of kidnap or they rescue used to. If they, they, are they don't. They, yeah, they yeah. don't. They don't do it anymore. It's uh, is, as far as I know, the practice has ended pretty much worldwide. Um, there might be the occasional uh, uh, killer whale capture that happens in like Iceland or maybe Norway or Russia, uh, but for the most part, the practice has ended. Uh, especially because SeaWorld here in Orlando figured out how to breed killer whales. Uh, they actually started oh, wow. breeding them. Um, at first, they were letting the killer whales do their own thing. Um, <laughs> you know, and but they also started doing artificial insemination. Um, there are a lot of questions about the gene pool because they only had a few males that they could use for artificial insemination. Um, and one of those killer whales that they were using has been involved, I wouldn't say caused, but has been involved in three human related deaths. Um, he, that killer whale died in 2016. Um, he, was, he was a pretty old guy, um, but there was a death that happened in 2010 it was either 2009 or 2010, um, that he killed one of his trainers, um, a trainer that he had been working with for 10 years, over 10 years. Um, I used to work at SeaWorld and it was something we had to address because there's no denying it. Like it happens. Mm. Um, it's a risky other two job. It's a tough job. Yeah. The other two deaths that had happened with that killer whale, um, it's a little bit questionable on the circumstances. There was one gentleman that uh, he snuck into the park at night and smoked some marijuana and then stripped naked and jumped into the killer whale pool. Oh. Uh, that water is 50 degrees. Uh, that's Fahrenheit. Let's see. That would be like 10 Celsius. Like it's cold. It's really cold. It's cold. And uh, they ended up determining that he died of hypothermia. Um, that the killer whale had nothing to do with his death, but he was swimming after it. Um, so with killer whales in captivity, I was going to say, I had a question on this line. Mm -hmm. uh, we have killer whales and dolphins in aquariums, but uh, not sharks. So, or not whales as such. So what is the difference between these three and why don't we find sharks playing with balls like killer whale or dolphins? So, oh, we, uh, I don't know. so, so sharks are, uh, are a type of fish. A lot of people forget that sharks are fish. Um, fish do not typically, uh, have those social behaviors like what we would see in mammals. Uh, their brains aren't nearly as big, 
relatively speaking. Um, they don't have the kinds of social interactions that we think of. Like with a dolphin, you can see them playing with each other um, because dolphins are mammals, just like us. So are whales. Excuse me. Um, sharks don't do that, as far as we can tell. Um, we are starting to understand more and more that sharks do have social behaviors. They're just very different from what we can see, obviously. Um, when a whale it's dies... Prehistoric. Out, yeah, it is It is very prehistoric in a lot of ways. It's just something that, as, as humans, we have a difficult time comprehending. Um, but, but there's certain things that we can kind of relate it to. Um, when a whale dies out in the ocean, sharks eat that. That is a good source of food for them. Um, but there is a hierarchy uh, in these wild sharks of different species with who gets to eat first at this, at this you know, dead whale. Um, we see this happening now, and we can now recognize it, that, oh, there, there is some sort of a social interaction here happening. Um, it doesn't seem to be nearly as complex as like what's happening in dolphins and whales. Um, but they do have these social behaviors, uh, but they don't play with toys as far as we can tell. Um, they, they, you know, you won't see a, a shark jumping out of water to hit a ball or jump through a hoop anytime soon. Uh, but there have been experiments in the past uh, where they have trained sharks to recognize different colored objects. Um, there are, a, there's a program at the Georgia Aquarium, which is, I believe still the largest aquarium in the world, they have four whale sharks on display. And those whale sharks are trained to go to these different colored stations to go feed. So you have whale shark one feeds whale at the blue station. Whale sharks are lesser, whale sharks are lesser uh, aggressive, right? They are yeah, they, they're, they're not in a, they, they are sharks. They're called whale sharks because they're a shark that's the size of a whale. Some people get confused on that. They say, well, are they whales or are they sharks? They are sharks. Um, <laughs> but they, uh, they are uh, plankton feeders. They feed on plankton. Um, a whale shark's throat is the size of your fist. You, if they tried to swallow you, they physically couldn't. Um, they are huge, though. They're the biggest fish in the sea. Uh, they can get up to 40 feet long. So we're talking uh, 12 to 13 meters. Um, absolutely massive fish. Uh, but they feed on some of the smallest things that live in the sea, like plankton. Um, plankton, zooplankton. Yep, there we go. Um, so you can see how big the whale shark's mouth is and the way that it opens. If you scroll down just a little bit, there's a better picture of their mouth yeah, open. There we go. And you can see just how big their mouth opens so that way they can engulf all of the plankton um, or sometimes small fish that they're feeding on and so they swallow it all whole. What is a plankton and what is a fish? So plankton... <laughs> That's a, it's a bit of a complicated answer. So uh, the way that marine biologists define a plankton um, are a lot of different ways. Plankton can be algae. They can be little teeny tiny uh, um, crustaceans. They can even be baby fish. A plankton is anything in the water that cannot swim on its own. It is subject to the currents and the tides. It can't actually determine oh. where it wants to go in the water. That's how we define plankton. Um, it's a very broad term. But whenever we actually get into, like, what kinds of animals are we calling plankton, we have shrimp, we have krill, we have various types of, of other uh, arthropods, like, like amphipods, um, different things. Some jellyfish are considered uh, plankton. Um even baby fish, whenever fish are first born um, or hatched, they oftentimes can't swim on their own. So they just kind of get pulled around. Um, all of so those things the fact, are edible. Just just for the fact, uh, baby sharks are, like the baby shark, that's the song. Anyways, the shark, baby sharks are born out of eggs, right? Or are they? Uh, oh, man. Born? I love this question. This is one of my favorite questions in all of marine biology because it's really cool. So sharks... <laughs> are a little different from other fish, even though they are fish. 
Um, they give birth in three different ways. Uh, the first way is they lay eggs, uh, just like what a lizard does. Uh, shark eggs look very different from what a lizard egg might look like or from what a chicken egg might look like. Um, a lot of times it's called a mermaid's purse because you can actually see the little baby shark inside. Uh, we call baby sharks pups. Um, so you can see the, what do you the call shark them? pup. Uh, a pup. Like a, like a pup, puppy dog. Puppy. Pup. Yeah. Yep. Um, so they can lay eggs. They can give live birth very similarly to how humans do. Um, there we go. Those are, those are great pictures. Uh, stingrays also lay eggs as well. Um, this, this is an egg. Yeah. Yeah. That's an egg. Um, and you can see Crazy. the the title on that image says a mermaid's person. That was always kind of a nickname for them uh, because it's a very unusual looking object like that. You wouldn't look at that and be like, oh, this is an egg. Um, but you can see there's a couple other images where they have a light behind the egg and you can actually see the embryo and the developing animal inside. Uh, so I would look at that and that looks like a shark to me. Um but other things like stingrays use uh, a very similar breeding method. The other way that they give birth... Yeah, locket pendant. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Although it would probably start stinking really quickly. Um, the other way is they give live birth, just like very similarly to like what uh, a cat or a dog or a human does. Um, so they don't... They don't live feed their young. They don't give them like, they don't have breasts or anything to, to give milk to them. Um, they just push them out and that's, they're done. Um, the last way that they give birth is they give a false live birth. This is a little complicated. Uh, so you have to imagine they have a womb inside of them. Um, they lay their eggs inside the womb and then the eggs hatch inside their womb. So they go from laying eggs inside them to carrying their pups. The thing is, is once those eggs hatch inside of them, they don't have a food source. So they start eating each other. And we call this inner uterine cannibalism. And it's one of like my oh favorite my terms in science. It, it sounds horrible. It sounds absolutely horrible. The, um, but that's nature. That is how nature works. Literally, is, literally yeah. born cannibals. Yeah. Yeah. Born cannibals. And then after they've eaten their siblings in the womb, uh, the mother shark will start producing extra eggs, not for them to be fertilized, but for the shark pup to feed on. So they feed, they live inside their mother's womb for an extended period of time and then hatch out already or are, are live born, uh, already a fully developed baby shark, shark pup. Um, and so sharks like great whites, sand tigers, makos, uh, are all sharks that use that sort of false live birth. Uh, we call it aplacental viviparity. Um, but the, the biggest term to remember there is inner uterine cannibalism because it's such a bizarre and, and graphic term. It's, it's kind of perfect for describing them. So talking about planktons, Oh, wait. Um, talking just continue. Let's talk about birth. Mm -hmm. Whale also give birth. And people forget that where the word mammal comes from, it's from the mammary gland, which is the function of producing milk. So yep. I have never really seen uh, whale breast uh, or say, so how, <laughs> or how is the milk or by any chance did you get to get a taste of the milk of <laughs> no no i've never tasted their milk um it is so uh dolphins and whales uh their milk is 33 percent fat so it almost looks like a paste it's not really like it's not like cow's milk that you would buy at the store it's nothing like that it's more of the consistency of toothpaste um so it's very very thick and there's a lot of fat in there which is really great for cream yeah. Yeah. It's very creamy. Um, so, uh, they do have two mammary glands on them. Um, they are, they look like, um, I don't know. I don't know how graphic I can be with this. Um, so they have their, um, genitalia 
down near their tail, uh, and it's just a slit along the bottom of their tail. And if you look at a picture of them, the way that you can tell a female uh, dolphin or whale from a male is that the male will just have the slit. The female will have two little dots next to um, their genitals. And those are their mammary glands. Um, if you look up, uh, I, I don't know if there's a, a good picture of it out there because it's not something a lot of people um, want to photograph, but uh, it yeah. is something that they have. So it's, we, we, I would always tell people that the best way to tell the difference is that if you look at their stomach and they have a, um, they have a, a division symbol, that is a female. If they just have a subtraction symbol, that's a male. Um, here is something. This picture here. Right? Yes, kind of that's actually on. perfect. That's actually a perfect picture. Can you zoom in on it? So what you're seeing that yellow arrow pointing to are, th this is a humpback whale and it's pointing towards uh, their genital region, but you can kind of see these two little dark lines in the white area. Let me, that's let me, find, a, let me find a better high quality photo of that. Is wait. Uh, mm, oh, that one's a little hard to see. Anyways, yeah, let's just go with this. But you can see in those white areas that they've zoomed in on, there's two little kind of dark slits on either side of the main gap there, uh, those are the mammary glands. Uh, and so what they'll do is uh, they have tongues and the dolphin or whale calf will come up to their mother and they'll kind of roll their tongue into a tube and the mother whale or dolphin kind of squirts the milk out of their mammary glands directly into uh, the calf's tongue. So that way they, uh, oh. they don't miss out on any of the milk. So they don't suckle. So they don't the suck. Way, yeah, they don't, they don't yeah. suckle the way they that don't we suck. Do. Yeah, they they just kind of yeah. squirt it out. <laughs> but, uh, very, but yeah, that's, that's how they do it. So yeah, it's there's there's all sorts of interesting ways that these animals have adapted to living in in a liquid environment um, where they are. That, that they can't drink either. Um, whales can't drink the seawater that they swim in. They get all of their water from the food that they eat. It's kind of like if you were to eat watermelon all That day, is strange. I've never known about that. Please tell yeah. me more about that. So, uh, so because of the way that salt water affects your body, um, and this is true for whales as well, because of the way that salt water affects them, they can't drink it. Um, it would poison them. Uh, so instead, they get all of their fresh water from the food that they eat. Uh, so if you were to imagine, uh, if you were to eat watermelon all day, or you were to just spend all day eating fruit and nothing else, uh, you probably wouldn't get very thirsty because there's a lot of water already in the fruit that you've been eating. The exact same thing is true for saltwater fish. Um, they have a way of getting rid of the salt that they ingest. So they just essentially are little swimming water bottles to a whale or a dolphin. Uh, so that's how they get all of their hydration is by eating. Um, so I, I think that that's a, a really cool thing that we don't really think about. It's like, where do they get their, their water source yeah. from? Um, and so they get it from the food that they eat. They don't directly drink anything except for milk. The question doesn't arise because water, water everywhere, right? I mean, people wouldn't think that even for <laughs> sea creatures, the water is too salty to drink or consume. Yeah. So, uh, <sighs> Yeah, it doesn't fish. even occur like that. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting thing, and that's what I love about marine biology is that there's so many different things that we don't normally think about until until we get to that point where we're just like, do they actually drink the water that they swim in? And the answer is no. For whales, uh, fish do fish do drink the salt water, but they can their bodies have a way of very quickly excreting the salt and separating the salt from the water. And they keep the water in their body and get rid of the salt. Wow. So um, another question about 
the blue whale and the sh- whale shark they open their mouth so huge and then they try to grab the planktons i've heard that blue whale is so huge but still their throat is like a size of a uh, bun or, or a what do you say bread loaf so why why is that so and if they are opening their mouth so why doesn't that water all that go in in the body that's a that's a great question so uh we'll we'll use blue whales as the the example for this um so whenever a blue whale feeds um the way that their mouth is shaped uh they don't have teeth in the way that we think of them um instead blue whales in all big whales are what we call baleen whales uh baleen is what they have instead of teeth baleen are it looks kind of like hair um if you imagine they have their whole upper and sometimes lower jaw covered in this thick baleen and they use that as a filter um so what they do is they engulf a bunch of water and plankton and then they compress their mouth to drain the water through their baleen that's a good example of it so you can see in the yellow that would be their baleen and then whenever they close their mouth and they 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 compress it from the bottom all the water is pushed through the baleen and all of the plankton that they've just captured stay inside their mouth they can't get through the filter um so that's why we call them filter feeders is because this is how they they're literally filtering their food out from the water now if you imagine um if it, it's kind of like if you were to take a sip of water and you get like an ice cube stuck in your mouth you can squirt all the water out of your mouth and still have the ice cube inside of your mouth um that's very similarly to what baleen whales do uh and because their food is so tiny and even with that nice big gulp that they just got there's a a picture of a humpback there and you can see its throat expanded um it's the one where its head is kind of sticking up out of the water on the right Yes, that one. So that pink and white part, that's a, literally their throat expanding and being filled with water and, uh, and and plankton or fish, whatever this whale is going for in this moment. That illustration's really good. There you go. Yeah. So you can see how their throat expands. And then as they contract everything, the pressure of that forces the water through their baleen and then they can keep whatever they caught with that nice big gulp. Wow. I so. just from evolution point of view, why did they have to grow so huge and just eat plankton? I mean, they can eat anything they want because they're so big. Yeah. Um that is a really good question that we're still not entirely sure of. Um what we do see with the fossil record uh it should be about 30 to 45 million years ago. Um the whales that existed at the time were all predators they they were all predatory whales uh they ate things um but some of them started to get really big all of a sudden most of them stayed within you know 10 to 15 feet long uh three meters and then all of a sudden they got really big out of nowhere um and we're not quite sure what prompted that that this this huge growth spurt that they went through and uh with that they needed something to sustain themselves well there was already a really big predator out there at the time and that was the megalodon shark which is now extinct that was the biggest shark we think the biggest shark to have ever lived uh we think that they might have been bigger than the blue whale uh not bigger than the blue whale uh we think that uh a blue whale can get to 33 meters long uh, absolutely they're the biggest animal to have ever existed on earth i i think that's really cool the biggest animal to have ever existed on earth is alive right now bigger than any dinosaur that ever that wow. ever lived and it's alive right now um and one of the largest populations of blue whales is actually right off of sri lanka uh they they have their breeding population there um so oh you, i didn't know that yeah yeah they um that's uh one of the cool things about blue whales is that they have a big breeding population um there you go that's a that's a great example of just how huge they are uh their heart is the size of a small car they're they're 
absolutely enormous animals. Um, biggest whale to have ever existed on, on planet Earth. Um, but with, um, with the sharks that I was saying, the megalodon would get 20 meters long. Um, and so it is possible that a defensive measure the whales might have evolved would be body size. Uh, it's kind of like if you were to, if you were to see, uh, a guy that's a lot bigger than you, you probably wouldn't want to fight him. Right. Or if, uh, a lion wouldn't attack an elephant because the elephant is so much bigger, even if the elephant isn't a predator. So body size is in a good defense against predation. Uh, just being so big that whatever your predator is, doesn't want to mess with you. Um, so we think that maybe that's why they evolved this suddenly like huge size, how they made the switch from fish to plankton. We're still not entirely sure of, um, but that's one of the cool things about evolution and natural selection is that it only takes a few small changes to make a big overall change in the long run. Planktons are so small and I mean, wow. how do they get this all? I mean, for their requirement for one that big girl they want, they need so many planktons together at a point, right? How do they manage to get all that together? Or is, is there something that they do? Well, that's, them? that's the other thing is that with the way that their migrations work, um, animals base their migrations on two things, uh, temperature and food availability, because there's no point in going somewhere. If you're a wild animal, there's no point in going somewhere if there's not going to be any food. So over time, they've developed behaviors that they know instinctually where to go, where the food is going to be prevalent. Um, the problem arises is when they get there and the food that they have depended on for many times generations is no longer there. Um, so for example, we have uh, over on the west coast of the United States, we have the gray whale. Uh, in the summertime, they live up near Alaska and Russia uh, in the Arctic. They live in very, very cold waters because there's a lot of food there. Uh, during the wintertime though, when it gets too cold, they start moving south and they actually go south from Alaska all the way down to Mexico. Uh, and they migrate right along the coast of uh, the United States, Canada, and Mexico, um, all the way down to their breeding grounds in Baja, California, which is a part of Mexico. Um, they have developed this over time because they know that's where the food's going to be. They know that there's going to be food in Alaska for them. They know there's going to be food in Mexico for them. And they follow that year after year. Now, if one year they were to show up in Alaska and there wouldn't be any plankton there for them to eat or any small fish that they feed on as well, uh, that would be hugely detrimental to the species because like they depend on that. And that is something we have started to see over the last couple hundred years as we start to fish areas because we do catch plankton, human fisheries do catch plankton as well. And sometimes the other small, what we call bait fish that whales eat as well. Uh, as we start catching more and more of them, that's less food for the whales. So we're sometimes seeing their migration patterns change, uh, which is something that's totally new to science. We've never seen their migration patterns change like that. Everybody should become vegetarians. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's I a mean, like the, conversation. Yeah, that is Why? that is one thing. <laughs> well, I want to ask this question to you. Have you ever wondered about riding a whale? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you can't you can't be around them and not think about it. Um, there is uh, a legend in the um, in the the Maori people of New Zealand. Um, that they talk about whale riders in their legends uh, and everything. I've, I've thought about it. I think it'd be cooler to ride a shark because I like sharks more than whales. Um, but th I had um, I had an encounter with a humpback whale off the coast of Massachusetts a few years ago. Um, and in the yeah. photo album I sent you, there's uh, uh, some photos you'll see 
of a whale's head really, really close in like green water. There's two photos that are in color and then one that's in black and white. Uh, I'm about 10 meters away from that whale. Uh, it came right up next to the boat. Um, and it definitely crossed my mind that like I could jump off this boat and land on this whale right now. Um, which was really cool. If you go down a little bit further, a little bit further. There this we one. go, right there. Yep. So that was uh, that was a young humpback whale that swam up to my boat um, that I was on at the time. Uh, this whale is probably twenty feet, so that's like seventeen meters. So not not as big as they get. It's about half the size that they'll get. Uh, they get um, they'll they'll get fifteen meters long. Um, <laughs> Why so, are their uh, why are their faces or bodies so like what is what are what is this thing stuck to them? Why is it so rough? Uh, those are plank uh, not plankton. Those are barnacles. Uh, so those are uh, barnacles are a small type of crustacean related to crabs that uh, instead of swimming around or pinching things like what we imagine crabs to do, instead barnacles are uh, uh, what we call a sedentary animal. Uh, whenever they are first born, parasite. Not, not a parasite. They're not a parasite. Um, instead, what they do is they attach themselves to, in this case, a whale. Uh, sometimes they attach themselves to rocks. Sometimes they attach themselves to uh, uh, the pilings of a pier or a dock. Just basically whatever they can stick to. Um, they stick to it, and they are also filter feeders like whales. Uh, they have these little tiny... Uh, uh, feathery appendages that come out and kind of like grab food around them. They literally do this motion. Um, and that's what you're seeing on this whale. These are what we call whale barnacles. Um, they're a so special they are, type of barnacle that, that lives on whales. They are the real whale riders. Yes, they are. They are the whale. They're <laughs> the original whale riders. So, and they will live their entire lives uh, on, on a whale, um, which is really cool. So very, I wonder how very they good. reproduce. So the way that they reproduce on the body of the whales. Yeah. So uh, the way that they reproduce is um, so barnacles have the um, they have they have a penis um, and they have the longest penis to body ratio of any animal in the animal kingdom. Um, the male oh will God. stick his penis out and will move it around looking for a female to um, inseminate. Uh, their breeding seasons actually line up with the whale's breeding seasons. Those are great pictures of them. Um, they Their breeding seasons are relative to the whale's breeding seasons uh, because whenever the whales are in the process of swimming together for mating, uh, the barnacles on their face will also be doing the exact same thing. <laughs> um, there was, a, there was a, a study that I looked at that it was like if humans had the same uh, penis to body ratio that a barnacle had, our penises would be uh, somewhere between 30 to 100 meters long. Um, it's like, it's enormous. 30 um, meters. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So, I mean, crazy. So, I mean, it's like having a human body and a penis size of a whale. Yeah, essentially. <laughs> so, but that's what barnacles do is they, they use it to probe around uh, there, there's videos of it online. It looks like a tentacle coming out and looking around for uh, a lady barnacle. Um, they're actually hermaphrodites, so they are they have male parts and female parts at the exact same time. Um, so they can they can, and then whenever they are fertilized, they release their eggs out into the water. Uh, their eggs hatch out and become a type of plankton for a little bit and are floating around and then hopefully they find a whale that they can stick to. Is it only the blue whales they stick to or uh, any other? Because I've seen this mostly on blue whales. Yeah, 
Um, that's uh, so that picture there on the right is uh, that looks like a humpback to me. Um, and you can see both of those pictures look like humpbacks. Uh, so you can see those little white spots are the whale barnacles that are on top mm-hmm. of them. Um, it's all okay. whales. Um, I've seen these barnacles also attached to manatees, uh, which are a really unique species that we have here in Florida. I've never seen one on a dolphin. Um, but I have seen them on big whales and I have seen them on manatees before and sea turtles. They attach dolphins to sea turtles. are too fast for them to catch on to. I think they're too fast. The other thing is that dolphins, um, they like to scratch themselves a lot. They uh, will rub up against stuff very frequently. If you look at pictures, some pictures, I like that. <laughs> um, if you look at pictures of dolphins, a lot of times they have scratch is... marks all over their body. This is a creation of mine. It's a whale rider, whale riding astronaut. I love it. Is this an NFT that you're going to sell? Yes. 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 It's That's on, awesome. On foundation. Yeah. That's Ride great. the whale within you to the moon and beyond because uh, become the cosmic travel transcend space time. That's awesome. Is what it says. That's so great. It's very cool. <laughs> Uh, the I love whole this creation of NFTs is so fascinating to me. <sighs> so have you created NFTs? I have not. Um, so whenever I am, whenever I'm creating my videos, um, I use uh, motion graphics and then I do a little bit in Photoshop as well. Um, but I, I'm not, I'm not an artist in the same way that you are. I don't really create art the same way. Um, we can definitely have a conversation on this because there's so many tools and AI that you can use with just words. You can create, uh, photos or images, you know, uh, and you have so much literature on anim- animals and so much imagination that shows clearly through your videos. So you definitely will do a good job on it. So thank you. yeah, maybe at the end of this video, let's create a live piece. So in front sure. of you, I'll, you give me a description and I'll create one for you. That would be so, so cool. I'm about it. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. So till, till I get things ready, I wanted to ask you about whales reproduction. I had heard that, uh, these horror movies, uh, the sea horror movies used to show these things flying out and roaming around. Those are actually <laughs> whale penis. <laughs> Um, so that is, uh, the way that whales reproduce is very similar to how we do. Um, they have all the same organs and the only difference is they don't have hands or legs. Um, a lot of times what we see is sometimes, uh, the male might use his flippers to kind of hug the female, um, and reproduce. It is very fast. Um, it is like that. It is in and out and that's over. Um, they might try a couple times, but that's about it. Um, I, I don't know the age range of your, your listener base, but, uh, that's, that's about all there is to it. Uh, but, but I also heard they have to go on their back and on be on the surface and then <laughs> they have to actually search for, the accurate lo- location to, I mean, I mean it's a, <laughs> sometimes it's a tough, yeah. they, um, their whales are very good at communicating with one another. Um, smaller whales like dolphins use their echolocation and, uh, we're pretty sure that they can communicate with each other f- through that. Uh, larger whales like humpback whales do a lot of singing. Um, so they're pretty sure we're, we're pretty sure they're very aware of where everyone else is. Um, in terms of the whale community. Um, so for that, the, the next thing is that whales do have preferences. Uh, one male or one female might be more desirable than another, um, which is very consistent across all animals, including humans. We all do that. We all have preferences for what is a desirable, uh, mate. Yeah. I and, think, you know, that's the... That's the answer for which I always wondered, like, why do you need two sexes, right? Why do you need two sex? Like just one animal, like a, why can't I, mean, even in plants, there are like male and female stuff. So yeah, why these two kind of things? Why just not like robots or a factory, which just keeps producing. 
So as you mentioned, so, finding the best best mate, I think that keeps the uh, selfish gene moving forward. The best ones keep moving forward, sort of selectively. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, it is. That is that is one of the biggest parts about natural selection is that you want to, and this is this is consistent for all animals. You want to reproduce with someone who is going to uh, either give the best genes to you or is going to looks like they are going to take the best care of your offspring. Uh, so for a, a female animal to look to a male animal, they would say, okay, can he provide? Is he really good at hunting or catching fish? Um, or, or whatever your food is in, in your ecosystem. Um, is he really good at doing that? Because if he's good at doing that for himself, he can do that for me while I'm pregnant or bearing his children. Or if you're an animal that the male sticks around to help take care of the offspring, he could also provide to your children. Uh, if you are a male animal, you want to look to a female that is going to have healthy offspring. Um, there's certain there's certain cues that different species pick up on. Uh, you want something that isn't. You, you want someone that's not going to be diseased of any kind, and that's for both males and females. You don't want to uh, reproduce with a sick person um, because there's a possibility that your offspring will inherit that sickness. Um, and that is how natural selection works. A lot of people talk about survival of the fittest. Um, that terminology has kind of been warped over the last few years because people don't understand exactly what that means. So instead we mm -hmm. just stick to natural selection. Um, just saying <laughs> natural selection is what we, what we choose. And it, even among humans, it's, it's correct. Like if you, if you are looking for someone to have children with, you're going to choose someone that's healthy over someone that's sick. You know, I was segue on that. I was segue on that. Survival of the fittest now is the survival of the smartest or something, right? So Elon Musk says a very nice thing about it. Um, that intelligent people have stopped producing kids or they delay it or there's some issues with that. And there's going to be a population collapse very soon. And uh, on the other hand, the not so smart people have many more children. So there was a movie about that, which he showed. I, I knew you were going to say this idiocracy. <laughs> is that the name of the movie? That is the name of the movie. It was uh, created by Mike Judge in like 2006. It's called Idiocracy. And that is the opening of the film is they talk about how smart people have stopped reproducing at the rate where um, not so smart people have. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the title of it. There we go. Um, so <laughs> using this logic, how do you think the genes or the selfish genes are going to progress? Because if the smart people stop <laughs> passing um, their genes on, that is that is a really good question. Um, I am not an anthropologist, so I do not feel qualified to answer that. Um, I would say that it feels a little bit uh, doom and gloom to talk about it. Um, mm. But there no, are but our genes are smart. Our genes are smarter than what we think. They have survived all these years, and that's where I would suggest the audience another awesome book. Uh, the selfish gene that you should definitely read. I'll put a link for the on that below. So, I would absolutely it... agree with that. That is a wonderful, wonderful book, um, and and probably one of the best books about biology that's written for everyone. It's not a biology book. It's just a concept of biology uh, that was taken. Um, fun fact: the word meme actually originates from that book. Um, Richard Dawkins created the word meme uh, because a gene is something that's passed along in our DNA. A meme is an idea that's passed along by our, our cultures. Um, and that is where so the word meme comes from. Are you saying Richard Dawkins pride, coined that word? 
Wow. Yes, he did coin the word meme. That's amazing. I mean, we use the memes so often. And, yeah. And uh, glad he used this. In the book, I believe he says the very that first he, meme. He, he used this in 1970s. Wow. Yeah. He, he was talking um, specifically about the creation of fire. That fire, the creation of fire is kind of the first meme. Um, because it's something that we don't pass along through our DNA to our offspring how to make fire. Instead, we teach them how to do it. Uh, so the meme is the idea that we are sharing. And as that idea, and that's really what memes are. They're just basic ideas. Um, and when a meme goes viral, it's an idea that everyone kind of <sighs> hangs on to. And so that is, but Richard Dawkins coined the term meme in the book, The Selfish Gene. It's brilliant, it's an brilliant, book. absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And yeah, just, just, just like the virus goes viral and passes on his genes, like just explodes like that. I guess the meme goes mm -hmm. viral and the, the whole terminology like that. So meme is me, 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 ma, which in Greek, which means imitated. Uh, wow. That's very interesting fun fact, right? It's very yeah. awesome. So see, I don't just have facts about I mean, whales. I got other stuff too. Yeah. You should definitely subscribe to his uh, YouTube and uh, Instagram for all these fun stuff. So, uh, Zach, talking about whale uh, singing, I pulled a video of whale singing. Let's see what. Let's try and interpret what she's saying. Let's Are listen in. Let's go for it. <sighs> So I'm not hearing anything on my end. Um, oh, you're not hearing. I am okay. not. I'm not hearing anything on my end. Uh, but oh, I no. will say um, I've listened to whales sing many times. Uh, sometimes I, I fall asleep listening to it because uh, it's such a nice sound. Um, and it's very different from any sort of singing that we do. Um, the... I'll, I'll put the link of this and I think the audience have heard and I'll just check. I'll have to check it after the video is produced. But I, as I was like keenly hearing to this for the first time and it has so much vocal range. It's not yeah. just beep beep or bap bap. It's like so many vocals, low pitch, high pitch and a lot of modulation and it could actually be a language. I mean, wow. Yeah. So what, what you just said with it being a language, that's what we think whale singing actually is. We think that that is actually how they communicate with one another. We're, we're talking big whales here. Uh, thing, like humpbacks are the, the most famous ones for singing. Um, so whenever they are singing, we're not sure exactly what they're saying, but we are, we do know a few things. Uh, they will sing back and forth to one another. Uh, mothers will sing to their calves and will teach their calves how to sing. Uh, the calf of one whale might have a very similar song to its mother uh, with slight differences. It's kind of like if, uh, if your parents speak with an accent while you're growing up, you might develop that accent as you get older. It's very, very similar to what we see in whales. Um, we do know that they will communicate back and forth. Uh, they will communicate territory. They will communicate threats. Uh, if like a killer whale were to show up, they start singing um, or start vocalizing about it. That's the other thing is we call it a vocalization. The thing that I think is the most interesting here, and this is, this is something that we are still discussing in the sciences that we aren't a hundred percent sure on, but many whales and dolphins uh, sperm whales, humpback whales, many different species of dolphins. They have what we call a, uh, a signature. It is a call that is entirely unique to that individual animal. So dolphin A might have a signature that is completely different from dolphin B. The th reason that this is important is, is how they use it. Because it seems to be that there is intention 
behind how they use their signature call. So whenever I introduce myself to you, I say, hi there, my name is Zach Cole. I'm a, whale, a wildlife filmmaker, marine biologist. Uh, that would be my signature call. The way that these dolphins and whales are using it, whenever they meet a new dolphin or whale, they give their signature call. Almost like they're saying, hi there, my name is Zach Cole. I'm a, a marine, I'm a marine dolphin and a, a wildlife filmmaker. It seems like <laughs> they might, they might have something similar to a name for themselves. And that wow. is astounding because there are, even among chimpanzees and gorillas, like that, that's not something I... that they do. So dolphins and whales uh, might have names that they give themselves, and then they introduce themselves with that name. Just imagine a whale having this conversation. I identify as such and such. Yeah. That, but as funny as it is to put it into, into those words, we think that's what's happening. We think that's what's happening. Um, it, it's something that it's just... The, the more and more I think about it, in science, there's a, a concept that we call anthropomorphism, where you give human emotions to a non-human being. It might be like whenever you come home and your dog is acting excited to see you, and you think your dog is happy, and you think your dog is excited to see you, or maybe you think that your dog is sad about something. Happy and sad, those are human emotions. We don't know for a fact if dogs have those emotions, they might, we feel like they do, but we don't know for sure. Cause we can't talk to them the way that they talk to each other. Um, but you won't but believe they have, have you seen those videos where they give a board of different words to the dogs and they go and touch the different words and yeah, that is, that is a, that's, um, crazy. that's bunny, the poodle. That's his, that's his name is bunny. Um, and he touches different words, but, we think with whales, we think that might be actually what they're doing is introducing themselves and saying, hi there, my name is so-and-so the blue whale. Hi there, I am an Atlantic spotted dolphin. My name's Jimmy, the Atlantic spotted dolphin. It's, I had gone on a vacation to the North Pole, now I'm heading to the South Pole. Yeah, it, for, it, it, it's so silly to put it in those terms, but that might actually be what's going on. So when whales are singing to each other, we're still, we, we don't know what exactly they're talking about. We don't know if there's a conversation the way that you and I are having a conversation right now, but with whales, there does seem to be some much more complex behavior, socially speaking, than what we see happening in other animals. Because most of the time- I wish I wish uh, AI can, uh, once we have all this store of information about what a whale does, when, what sound and signals, I think AI can decode that language. It'd be Possibly. so cool to hear a conversation and know what they're talking about. And it'd be just mind blowing. There One was question a... I would like to ask the whale would be, what do you think about meaning in life? Like what? Does a whale wonder about its meaning in life? Yeah, that would, there was a, a quote that I, I heard. Um, there's an American YouTuber uh, named Michael Stevens who runs a channel called Vsauce. Um, it's a really great educational channel. And he was talking once about boredom. And he was talking about how boredom is such a, an interesting concept because as humans, when we experience boredom, you are experiencing a dissatisfaction with existing. That boredom is, is the human desire to do more than just exist. And what an interesting mm. idea that is. And so the question is, do animals feel bored? Feel. Do, do yeah. animals feel that? And there is more and more wow. evidence in, in the sciences that we think they might. We don't know if they process it the same way because asking a question about life like that, that is a very deep question that goes way beyond just boredom, but that is an introspective question. And 
introspection is not something we know other animals to do. And whales might well, we do still it. don't know. We have to decode. Exactly. <sighs> And that is, that's one of the exciting things about AI in the future is that they, they might be able to find the patterns to determine if it's an actual language. There was a woman in the Bahamas uh, that she had a, a light board that would light up different sequences. Um, and she would go underwater and she would show it to dolphins. And she was trying to communicate with them. Um, and there was a little bit of evidence that the dolphins might be responding to the lights and might actually be understanding this language that they were creating together. Um, I don't know what ended up happening with her studies. Um, I, I, there was a little bit of like questionability, like, oh, this might be a little dubious or maybe she's reaching for some things. No, um, talking about boredom, you know, talking about boredom, you have been in uh, the zoo or uh, what do you call... Um, Aquariums. Aquariums. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's captivity, right? We've experienced boredom and captivity and not having to do many things and being stuck in one location or a small place. So did you feel that that animal or was getting bored in aquarium? Or so when, so I worked at SeaWorld of Orlando for two years. Um, and in the two years that I was there, when I first started working there, I started as a summer intern and I was very against SeaWorld at the time. I did not have a positive conception of them. Um, I, I looked at it as this is just going to be a summer job and it's going to look good on my resume that I worked at their facility. And that'll be that. That was my thinking going in. Um, by the by the end of my first week i realized um nobody understands what's actually going on here because they do a lot of really good things um i think the people that actually take care of the animals there have the best intentions um in terms of who's running the show might be a different question but i haven't worked there in in nine years the last time i worked there was in 2014 things may have changed um with the animals that we had there, um, the I'll, I'll use the killer whales, for example. Um, the killer whales always seemed to be doing something. Um, there was never anything that I would look at and I'd be like, they look bored. Um, they, had, they always had toys in their habitats uh, or, or in what we call, we call them EEDs, environmental enrichment devices. Uh, it's a toy. That's, uh, that's the fancy science term that we use. It's a toy. Uh, it could be something as simple as a ball. Uh, there was one that we called a balloon that was a floating ball that had a long rope attached to it that would float at the surface of the water and the killer whales would come and they would tug on it and pull it down. Um, there, there were lots of different you things know, for them to, to I got just I, I just got another t-shirt idea. Uh, be a killer whale, don't get bored. Hashtag mental health. There you go. Yeah. They, um, the ways that they feed on things are another exciting way to enrich their life. Uh, so for example, you might go to, you might fix dinner for yourself one night. Maybe you fix a meal and then the next night you might go out to a restaurant, but there are restaurants that we have that are also like unique experiences. Um, so are you telling that the whale don't feed on the same kind of food every day? Do they have a variety or? Taste Correct. of preference. Yeah, they they are given a variety, not just in the food that they eat, because they do have certain things that are standards or staples in their diet, but they do feed them in different ways. No, but this is aquarium. No, I'm talking about in, in, in the oceans, in the wild. Oh, the ocean, absolutely. They eat different things. Uh, so a killer whale uh, that travels, because there's two different kinds of killer whales. There are what we call residents and transients. Uh, transient killer whales move all around the world. They go wherever they want. Resident killer whales... Globetrotters. Globetrotters, exactly. Resident killer whales stay in one place. Uh, or, or one large area. And within these different populations, we see them eating different things. Uh, especially depending on where they are and when they are. 
so a transient killer whale might go up to uh, Oregon or Washington or Alaska, and it might be feeding on salmon there. Uh, and then later in the year, it might go further south to South California, and it's eating sea lions or seals. Um, or it could go out into the middle of the ocean, and they could go kill a whale, and then they'll eat that. So they, even within the wild populations, they do have a variety in their diet. Um, and being an apex predator, they can go wherever they want without being worried about being eaten by something because nothing messes with killer whales. Sharks don't mess with them. Other whales don't mess with them. Um, most animals, whenever they see a killer whale, their immediate response is run away as quickly as possible or swim away as quickly <laughs> as possible because there's nothing they can do. They can't, they can't hurt them. Um, they're, they're too big, they're way too tough, they're really fast, and they're really only aggressive. Only humans can. So, yeah, only humans can, and even then it's pretty hard for us to. Um, so, they're, they're no, amazing That's not a animals. challenge to anybody, guys. It's we need to take care that's of them. It's not a challenge yeah. here anytime soon. <laughs> if anything, I, I'm a very <laughs> firm believer in a lot of, us, especially larger animals, are to be observed and not touched. <laughs> <laughs> All right, talking about whales, I, I got this uh, interesting image with different whales in it. Uh, never heard of their names before. Like we only hear blue whales and humpbacks and sperm whales from the maximum. But mm -hmm. finback, I never heard about finback. Can you tell a couple of facts about finback yeah. and we'll go around the whales? So finbacks, also we just call them fin whales. Um, I've actually only seen one in my life and there's a photo of it. Uh, it's a very bad photo, uh, in the album that I sent you. Uh, they are the second largest whale species. Uh, they'll get to 80 feet long, which is 25 meters. Um, they're, they're absolutely enormous. Um, and they actually hang out with humpbacks a lot. Uh, you might see a group of humpbacks and there will sometimes be a fin whale hanging out with them. And that is the photo that I got was I was photographing a, uh, a, a group of humpback whales and I was going through my photos later and I was like, that's not a humpback. Wait and a I, I talked to one of my friends and I was like, I was like, do you think that's a fin whale? And we, we both like debated it back and forth and we were referring to some of our guides and we were like, yep, that's a fin whale. Um, so fin whales are, uh, like I said, the second largest whale species. Um, they are, are very similar to a blue whale in every way, except that they're just not quite as big, still absolutely enormous whales. Um, but yeah, they, they don't, those two really big whales, the fin whales and the blue whales, they don't really get together in big groups like humpbacks do, but the fin whales will hang out, uh, with, um, humpbacks. So the big whales don't uh, go in a, they don't have a school or a gang. They are sometimes, solo. Sometimes they do. It's usually a solo act. Because whenever you're that big, the only thing you have to worry about is, is possibly being attacked by a, um, by a killer whale. <laughs> and even then, the chances of that happening are pretty low. Okay. So the next whale is a uh, right whale. So yeah. Is there a this... right and a wrong whale? <laughs> That, that is, so the way that they get their name, the way that they get their name, right whale, is from back in the day when whaling happened. Um, so whalers, they would say, oh, this is the right whale to kill. Uh, and so they, that's, a, that's a great picture of it to kind of showcase uh, how whaling works. Um, but that's why they got the name right whale is because... Uh, in terms of how much blubber they have, in terms of how much meat they have, they were considered the right whale to hunt. And that's how they got the name right whale. Um, what is really interesting, and keep that picture up right there, uh, the one that's on the right there, the North Atlantic right whale, those whales actually live uh, about half their life here in Florida. Uh, they're a very special whale because they're connected to, to Florida really well. Um, they spend their winter times... Uh, off the coast of Florida near Jacksonville, which is kind of at the top of our state. Um, and so the population of them here, uh, we call them the North Atlantic right whales. Um, they live part of their life in Florida 
and then the other part of their life up towards uh, Newfoundland um, and Nova Scotia. That's where they spend uh, up in Canada. They, that's where they spend so, the summer times. What are the What are the cool facts about the right whales? So I don't know if it's I don't know if it's uh, too cool, um, but one thing that's really interesting, specifically about the North Atlantic species. Um, and, and just another big whale, they get like 50 feet long, really, really, really big animal. Um, the males, uh, when the females come down to Florida to give birth and, and have their calves, the males all disappear. Uh, we think they go out into the middle of the Atlantic ocean and just kind of hang out in what we call a bachelor group. Um, because it's just, it just seems like that's all that they're doing. Uh, but they're going way, way, way out, out into the middle of, uh, uh, near like the Azores to an area called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And that's where these, these right whales sit. Uh, essentially the, the, the lady whales go to give birth and have kids. The males all go to have a party out in the middle of the ocean. Um, so whale, so whaling, a par- whaling is a single parent task, is it? Yes. Yes. Like it is. Um, parenting is, whales. Yes, it is. Um, usually there is no parental care given by the males. Um, once, is once it for the all, female, is it for all whales or just this right whale? Uh, to an extent it's for all whales. Um, the biggest, it's not a true exception. Uh, but in killer whales, there is usually a male around that will protect the females. Um, the, the females that he's protecting, they might not necessarily have his calves. And a lot of times they're not his calves at all, but he does act as kind of a guardian for that entire pod or, or group. Um, Mm -hmm. we, we, a lot of times call it, we're moving away from the definition of pod. We're seeing groups now more frequently. Um, but, uh, with whales, that's kind of the only real exception. Most of the time it is single parenting. Um, they're their very, very can... social. That means, yeah, most social of the whales, I believe, the killer whales. Yes, I, I would agree with that. The dolphin, dolphins in general are much more social, um, but the uh, the killer whales themselves are probably the most social out of them all. It's very what? weird to see a killer whale by themselves. What are these? Uh, so what you're seeing there, those, those white parts on the right whale. Uh, so earlier we talked about, uh, barnacles. Um, there is another type of animal that lives on them very similar to a barnacle, but it doesn't stay in one place. It's called a whale lice or a whale louse. Um, and on right whales, they're very specific because they live on these spots on the whale's skin called callosities. The whale actually naturally has these little areas where the whale lice can live. Um, and so it's interesting that the, um, that the, the whale itself would develop these spots dedicated to another animal to live on them. Um, which is, that is, that is evidence of, of a mutual, uh, situation. So there's a, a picture there of a diver with a right whale, and you can see that it has this white eyebrow. Um, that is all of the 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 white of that are whale lice. Hundreds of thousands of these little teeny tiny crustaceans that live on their skin, and that's what we're seeing that makes this eyebrow that they have. You can see the spots on the mouth and at the top of the mouth as well. Those are all. Thousands of little tiny animals that live on them. Do they benefit? Um, do they benefit from this, or are these lies like we have or animals have, where, where they are just blood suckers and we don't actually get anything out of them? So, as far as we can tell, this is actually a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, whales produce skin a lot faster than we do. Um, their wounds tend to heal relatively quickly, um, but because of that, uh, they have to remove a lot of excess skin. Uh, and because they don't have hands, instead they have developed this relationship with the whale lice uh. where the whale lice will actually eat their excess skin for them. <laughs> so the, the whale has a way to essentially scratch themselves uh, exactly. and, and gives a place for the lice to live. And then the lice get a free ride and a free meal. 
um, and a free place to live. So that is one of the cool things about mutualism. Um, they're they're really cool looking. If you look up um, whale lice, uh, they're really they might be a little gross. I've got some to say this at this point: uh, the whale has given, I mean, has hired things to scratch its back, and it yeah, says, "You scratch, you scratch my back, and I'll give you a place to live." You, Not you scratch, scratch my back, back and you can live on my face. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, that's, that's what we're seeing are uh, whale lice. And so the, the whales are born with these callosities that will eventually develop um, into, uh, there you go. The, the picture of the, it's the black background. Um, it's the, that's it. That is a whale louse. Oh, it's, it's, it's creepy. I mean, I wouldn't want creepy. it around my face. But if you think about it, if you think about it that, you know, you're a huge animal that doesn't have, that has itchy skin and you don't have any way to scratch it, uh, your next best bet is to have these guys live on your body to uh, uh, go ahead and, and eat your dead skin. Don't the, other, don't the other whales feel itchy like that? Because this one has the most of these. Yeah, so the, the right whales more specifically have the callosities than any others. Um, but the other whales, they, they do have their own adaptations. Uh, they'll rub up against each other. They'll scratch mm -hmm. themselves on the bottom of the ocean. They'll literally go down into the sand and rub themselves. Um, there's a few videos of it happening online. It's pretty cool to see. You know, um, about this... Um couple of more whales uh, this mm -hmm. I want to talk about. Like the humpback. What is a hump in this whale? I mean, there is a... <laughs> that, is, that is a great question. And I, I, I figured you would ask this one. So uh, back in the photo <laughs> album, um, there is a picture because a humpback is probably the worst name for a humpback whale. Uh, so there is a photo in the album that I sent you. Um, I'll pull it out. It is... Um, it's kind of, there, there's a photo, it's near the Rosiette Spoonbill, there's a crocodile, and then there is a photo of a humpback whale where you can see its blowhole sticking out of the water, it's kind of facing away from the camera. Um, it's, it's near the photos with the crocodile. That yeah, I so tell, tell us about that, till then I'll, I'll, I'll pull it out. Uh, so, the reason that humpback whales get their name humpback is because right before their dorsal fin, there is a little teeny tiny hump that sticks up off of their back. And it is a very, very, very small detail. Um, that is how they get the dorsal name. fin. What is a dorsal fin? Like, where is the a, a dorsal fin? A dorsal fin. Uh, it is, if you see the crocodile, if you go up a little bit, um, go back down. <laughs> it is. Keep going. That is, Stop ah, right yeah, there. Crocodile so there, yeah. it's the photo below the, the spoonbill, below the pink bird. That's a fish. Um, it's below the pink bird. There we go. That photo. Um, so you see what we're looking at is the back of a humpback whale. Uh, on the left side of the photo, you'll see something sticking up out of the water. That is their blowhole. Yep, that exactly. That is their blowhole. That is how they breathe. Um, they don't breathe through their mouth, and they don't have noses. Uh, instead, whales have uh, a blowhole on the top of their head. Um, it's essentially, it looks kind of like two nostrils in big whales. Uh, things like killer whales and dolphins only have one blowhole, versus uh, big whales have two. Um, but on the right side of the photo, you'll see something else sticking off of the whale, and that is the dorsal fin. Um, not all whales have dorsal fins, but humpbacks do. Um, so it's the little triangular part that sticks up out, um, on, on the dorsal fin, if you look at it, um, there's a part of it where it kind of forms a, 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 a low slope towards the front of the whale. That, that right there, that is the hump that we are talking about. It is a very small detail. And so you question, you're just like, okay, whoever named humpback whales, why did they look at that and call them that? Um, they have the longest flippers of any whales. So it, to me, it makes more sense to call them like a long flippered whale, but it doesn't sound nearly as good as a humpback. Um, but uh, 
Yeah, the dorsal fin um, acts very similarly uh, in swimming stabilization, uh, the same way that an airplane has a tail that sticks up off the end of the airplane that kind of goes up a little bit. Uh, it's to help keep them more stable in the water from rotating side to side. Yeah, I mean, the the fin back has a bigger dorsal fin, I believe. And Absolutely. look at the humpback. They should have... They should have yeah. been named for this thing. This is the flippers, right. right? Exactly. Exactly. Now you can see on our right whale that we talked about earlier, they don't have a dorsal fin. They don't have a dorsal fin at all. It's just not there. Um, you can also the see- The orca on... should have been called the humpback. Because look at this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not so all huge. of them have dorsal fins that big. That's usually a, a male killer whale. Um, and we see that really commonly in Pacific populations. Um, but in the Atlantic, the killer whales don't really have that to the extent that the Pacific populations do. Yeah. Um, orca is a very... killer whale, by the way, guys. Yes, orca yes, is an... a killer whale, yeah. An orca so... is a, another name for, for killer whale, and their their scientific name is Orsinus orca. One more interesting uh, person here or uh, whale here is Narwhal, which has this huge uh, sword coming out. I wonder what yeah. is the purpose of this and what do they do with it? Yeah, so that is that is another interesting thing. So uh, narwhals, uh, they live in the Arctic. They live specifically in the Atlantic side of the Arctic. So between Greenland and Russia uh, is the area of the world that they live in. And they live in, in mostly icy water. What you're seeing coming out of their head uh, is uh, uh, a tooth. It's a modified tooth. Uh, that we call, it's not technically a horn in the way that we think of it. Uh, the cool thing about it is that mostly the males have it. Female narwhals do not, sometimes they get it, but not always. Um, it's covered in a hairy, spongy material. You can kind of see in that one photo of the narwhal that's like sticking its head up out of the water, that one right there, you can see how it kind of comes out of one side of their head. And that's because it's one of their left molars that grows up through their skull. So imagine if one of your oh, teeth decided to grow center, through. Oh, it's not the center, it's in a side. Exactly, it's, it's slightly offset. So it's not perfectly centered in their head and it grows through their skull. But uh, sometimes the females get it, but usually it's just the males. And sometimes they can have two tusks. There are records of, of two tusked narwhals. Um, so that's what we call it. It's not a horn, it's a tusk. Um, a tusk is a modified tooth. Um, and that can get up to three meters long. It gets absolutely huge. And you'll notice that it has kind of this spiraling pattern on it. Um, in yeah. the medieval times, uh, people would catch narwhals and they would sell the horns as unicorn horns. That is that is where uh, unicorn horns came from. Um, so that is that's kind of the legend of the unicorn comes from this animal that's still alive. Um, so why do they the have narwhal these tusks? Is, it's the original the narwhal unicorn. Is the real unicorn? Yeah. Yes, ab absolutely. It's the original unicorn. Uh, the next question that we get about narwhals is why do they have these tusks? What purpose does it serve? And the answer is we have no clue. Um, we, we think <laughs> that the males might use it for social interactions. Uh, you can see in that picture, they're touching them, um, almost like they're having a, a lightsaber fight or something, uh, a sword fight. Um, but they might be using it in social interactions. Um, it's covered in nerves, so they can feel anything touching it. It's not that they can't feel it. They can feel things touching it. Um, you know what so I they... thought they were using it for? I thought they were using it for, like, cracking the ice and making yeah. way. Some people think that they, um, it's, a, it's a little too delicate for that because it's a, it's a tooth. Um, it does grow throughout their life, so it continuously grows. Um, but, yeah, they, um, it, it's it keeps on very... growing. Yeah, yeah, it keeps on growing because it does. It does break apart over time. They do have parts of it that will eventually fall apart, so it needs to continuously grow. Um, so, like, if it were to break, that would be super painful. Uh, but it will eventually regrow. Uh, uh, walruses' tusks do the exact same thing. It's just a little more striking on a narwhal. Don't you think uh, this is a evolutionary disadvantage to have 
this huge thing coming out of your mouth it would scare away the prey before even they get close isn't it <laughs> or do they fish with that horn uh, that they tooth? they do they don't fish with it it is um that's the thing about natural selection is that it wouldn't happen if it didn't serve them a purpose good enough to exist in the gene pool um it just happens that they're the only ones that have this tusk um it it's a little too delicate to break through the ice um so we think that it serves mostly in social interactions um they don't use it when hunting as far as we can tell um they don't use it whenever they're hunting um they just catch their fish just by catching them like any other dolphin would or or any other uh toothed whale would um but yeah it's it's just a they're a very bizarre uh whale species and their closest living relative is the beluga whale the white whale that you sometimes see in aquariums um narwhals do not take well to captivity but belugas do and a beluga is essentially a narwhal without the tusk oh so what what is the prey of the narwhal so narwhals and belugas eat a lot of fish um the other thing that they eat a lot of are uh cold water squids as well it's another very common item for them um but mostly fish they mostly eat fish squids are these amazing creatures how big is the biggest squid the, Can it the biggest scare away whales Yeah uh so the two biggest squid species there is the giant squid uh which is found all over the world in deep water um and they can get i think the biggest one ever found was like 10 meters um most of that is tentacle so the the actual body of it themselves is is much smaller but they're still pretty big uh their eyes are the size of dinner plates uh they have the biggest eyes in the animal kingdom. Um the other one is the colossal squid which seems to only be found down around Antarctica. Um as to how they deal with predators, um most of the time they are big enough to fight off most things their size. Uh but sperm whales uh almost exclusively eat giant squid. That is like they they mostly just eat giant squid uh which is really really cool. Uh they fight each other down in the deep waters. Uh so the killer the sperm whale will find will echolocate to find a giant squid and then attack it. Uh the giant squid on their arms and on their tentacles because they have both tentacles and arms. Uh they have these little hooks on them and they use those hooks to kind of slash at things. Um and so the front of sperm whale's faces are just really cut up. and that is from them catching a squid and in that squid's final moments and that giant squid's final moments they are clawing at the front of the sperm whale's face trying to get it to let them go ouch i don't like squids hey, oh squid is delicious yeah. i love eating squid i've never had but uh this i mean it's i don't know it's because of the movie that i'd seen when i was young but there was this movie where it these uh, huge squids would come and uh, engulf the ships or something like that but uh, <laughs> the, the yeah. legend of the kraken the kraken yeah what what is the legend of the kraken uh the the kraken is an old um sea sea story a, a, a mythical monster that was a giant squid big enough to attack a boat and pull it apart Um it's had a few iterations in other movies um over the past few years like Pirates of the Caribbean uh there was a movie about Greek mythology that had the Kraken in it but I can't remember the name of it um but there are depictions of the Kraken and it's just a giant squid could it actually take down a boat probably not even even an old wooden ship it's they're not big enough to take down wooden ships oh so that sperm whale you can see the scratch marks on the front of its face those are from giant squids clawing at them uh which is really cool um so that's literally evidence of of them eating a uh, a giant squid but battle, the mouths are so yeah battle scars <laughs> the mouth is so narrow and small yeah Compared Absolutely. To head. The um so the most of what you're seeing there um most of a sperm whale's head uh the majority of it is an organ called the melon like like a watermelon um 
it's called the melon. And that is where the, the melon is filled with this fatty lu- lipid fluid. Um, it's, it's kind of like a, an oil inside of it. And that is the spermaceti. Uh, that is how they get their name. Uh, sperm, because whenever they first started killing sperm whales, uh, they thought that that's what it was. It turns out it's not. Uh, there's a picture on the right there that's kind of a cross section. Yeah, so you can see how their how part of their head goes, and then you can also see there's kind of a it's kind of an orange spongy area. That's the actual melon itself. And that's where all of that fatty, yeah, there we go. The spermaceti organ. And so it's filled with that fluid and that's what whalers would target was because it made really good lamp oil. Oh, lamp. So that's where the oil came from for the lamp mm-hmm. before yep. petroleum. Yep. Oh yeah. So I guess there was just so, candles. Do you, do you like, where does the wax for candle come from before petroleum or whatever? Uh, so I don't know about candle wax itself, um, but I know for lanterns, uh, for many years, uh, for, for like a couple hundred years, we used whale oil. Um, so what you would do is you would you would either take the spermaceti um, or you would cut the fat off of a whale. And if you boil it blubber. down in, in the blubber, um, you can separate the oil from the tissue and then they would just collect, they would just skim the oil off the surface. And then they would use that as fuel for, uh, for lanterns. Um, some of the first basic steam engines were based off of. Must have um, been. Yeah, must have it been burns really, really, well. really expensive. There was a whole industry behind it. And it was all based off of harvesting it from these animals. Um, And so we talked about the right whale earlier, how they were the right whale to target because they had the most amount of blubber on them. Um, And and kind of a, a sad thing about the right whales is that whaling hasn't happened, at least here in the U.S., the way that it used to uh, in the last 120 years. Really, ever since we started, we switched over to petroleum products, which are much, much easier to produce. Whaling has really subsided here uh, and around the world. Um, But with like the right whales, uh, we're still seeing their population hasn't recovered whatsoever. Um, Right whales themselves, uh, there are less than 400 of them. The North Atlantic right whale that lives here in Florida, there's less than 400 of them. Um, Since 2016, only 70 have been born that we know of. Uh, oh so you God. say, so, so that's, that's, that's seven years. So that's 10 a year. And that's just the ones being born. Um, they die. Uh, we, we had one die a few months ago that washed up and it's like, this is a big deal because there's not a whole lot of them left. Um, and there are, there are things that we can do to help protect them. Um, the biggest thing here in the United States last week, we tried to, there were, there was a, an organization that was urging our president here to change some of the laws around shipping because one of the leading causes of deaths for right whales nowadays is they get hit by ships, what we call a collision. Um, a ship can't stop. It can't turn on a dime. These big cargo ships. Uh, they're very, very heavy, and they move pretty fast as well. And if they were but to hit a right whale, just kills it instantly. Can't um, they, like, honk? Because these whales are very sensitive to sonar, right? And the what the sound travels fast in the sea. So maybe they could just does. honk ahead? Possibly. Um, the biggest thing is is that it doesn't seem to work in the same way that we would expect it to, because even underwater, um, even though sound does travel very well underwater, it can be very difficult to know where that sound is coming from. Uh, So smaller whales like dolphins use echolocation where they send out a sound wave and then it bounces off of something back to them. And that's how they can figure out where it's coming from. Big whales like right whales and humpback whales, they can't do that. They sing to each other, but they can't tell 
exactly where it's coming from. It's very difficult to determine mm. the source of the sound. So with something like that, where you're honking uh, a ship horn to alert them, okay, maybe the, maybe the whale knows that there's a boat around, uh, but if the water's not clear, um, you can't, and you can't tell the direction that it's coming from, what use is it? So we were, there was an organization that was here in the U S that was urging the president to pass a law to change where ships can go. Because right now our shipping lanes are the exact same routes that the right whales take on their migration f to Florida, uh, to give birth here. Uh, and he ended up turning mm -hmm. it down and we're not entirely sure why, um, presidents do a lot of crazy things here in the U S. Um, and so <laughs> it, it could just be one thing and, and I don't want to get into politics here. Let's, I love let's not get politics. into that. Um, but you know, next it's question at least on his radar. Yeah. I hope they all get to uh, find out innovative ways to, uh, live in harmony with all kind of, uh, species. I do. Whale next topic is whale poop. So I've read and seen that whale poop is very expensive. And uh, what is it with the whale poop? So it's not actually the poop that's valuable. It's their vomit. Um, specifically, it's called ambergris. Um, here, I'll spell it out. Uh, it's called ambergris. Um, it is, it is their vomit. Um, and there you go. Um, the thing about it is that historically speaking, um, if you were to mash it up, it works really well at holding other smells and smells really good on its own. You would think like whale vomit would smell disgusting. It doesn't. Um, and so because of that, uh, ambergris is one of the most valuable substances on earth because it smells really good and it holds other scents. So you can take just like a little pinch of ambergris and add it to a perfume and it makes the perfume smell stronger and last longer on your skin. Um, and then it also adds a nice little earthy smell to it. It doesn't smell fishy. Um, I have only seen ambergris before. I've never actually held it, but I do know a few people that have smelled it before and they say it smells very pleasant. Um, it's not like a sweet smell, but they said it has a, a nice earthy smell to it. Um, it's worth two or three times more than gold in value. Um, so this, this, this is like a rock that stays, right? Even if you put in perfume, it won't dissolve or something like that. Um, you can, you can mash it up, but it is kind of a, a hard, rocky, lumpy material. Um, and so when, when we're seeing it like this, it I mean, does look like it doesn't a rock, biodegrade, can... right? Does it biodegrade further than this or? It does is biodegrade it just... a little bit, but not a lot. Okay. Okay. So it's not a sort of exhaustible thing like petrol or something like that. It can right. just live the... on. You can keep transferring it on and enjoy the smell generations ahead. Essentially, yeah. Um, it lasts for a very long time, um, especially if you collect it. If it does sit out in you know, the ocean or on the beach, it will biodegrade just through natural processes. Um, but for the most part, you can collect it. And if you keep it you know, contained and you know, in a nice, cool, dry environment, it won't really biodegrade at all. Um, and it doesn't really lose its smell over time. It kind of keeps it really well. Um, what it is, is uh, stomach acid uh, that is it specifically comes from sperm whales, um, but it's their stomach acid and they kind of vomit it up. And uh, whenever it comes into contact with seawater, it kind of solidifies a little bit into this rocky like substance that you see. And it floats on the surface of the water. Um, it's less dense than water, so it floats on the surface. And so sometimes people find it on the beach. Um, so oh. historically speaking, it was very desirable in the colonial era of, of Europe uh, to add to perfume or to the Victorian era of Europe 
to add to perfume because it made your perfume smell better. It made your perfume smell stronger and last longer. Uh, so it was very desirable among the nobility uh, in Europe at the time who wanted to cover up their body odor. De deodorant hadn't been invented yet. Um, so that was what they used instead. So it was a very in-demand product. Uh, fast forward to today, uh, ambergris is still incredibly valuable, but it is illegal in most countries. Um, I know for a fact it is illegal here in the United States. It is illegal in Canada. It is illegal in England, uh, which would potentially be the biggest markets of it. I believe it's also illegal in Australia. Those are the ones that I know for sure. Um, and the reason why it's illegal is because marine mammals, marine mammals are protected in those countries. And protection for a marine mammal also includes animal products. So whale oil, blubber, meat, and ambergris. Um, so it is, it is their vomit. And it's kind of crazy because most people find it on the beach. Um, it makes for a very cool thing to hang on to and keep around your house. Um, but you can't Spend sell it. Time. You're not, yeah, you're not supposed to keep it, but I, nobody's going to, I don't you think know, anyone's going to enforce that law. There's another thing that I saw on a documentary. Uh, these guys study poops of whales and uh, to, to see, to actually gauge the ecology of that particular area. They find poops and then do research on it, just like pathologists do for humans. So yeah. this, so he was saying, the smell of a poop of a whale is uh, like a cow's poop. <laughs> Interesting. I've never heard of that. I have only come into contact with dolphin poop before. Um, how did it, it smell? Sm it, it, it smells like poop. Um, it's not human poop or cow poop. Uh, uh, you know, when, when the first time that I ran into it, it, it doesn't. It's not. It, it's not nearly as bad as our poop. Our poop's pretty stinky. Um, <laughs> I I didn't make the comparison to a cow. It doesn't smell like terrible, but it does smell bad. Um, it's not a pleasant smell, um, but with, I know there was, um, no, we as humans are very used to cow poop smell, you know, because that yeah. uh, is used in so many places here. And like, I'm pretty sure everybody knows what's, uh, yeah, it's a, it doesn't smell good, but it doesn't necessarily have a, a horrible you know, stench to it. Yes. Um, We are coming to the end of a two hour mark. I had one very interesting topic. I think that's going to make a new episode, a uh, bioluminescent life in the oceans, but yeah, we'll, oh, yeah. We'll stay tuned. It'll be one of the upcoming episodes. Uh, now some more fun questions and then we'll dive into making a AI work uh, with Zach. Uh, Let's do it. So top, uh, what are your top movies that you would suggest on oceans? Uh, top movies that I would suggest on the oceans. Uh, number one is Jaws. That is my favorite movie of all time. Um, it is, in my opinion, uh, a pretty great film. It is a very scary movie. Um, it's about sharks. A lot of people are scared of sharks because of that movie. I am not one of those people. Um, it's fantastic. Everything about the movie is great. Um, even if it does vilify sharks a little bit. You know. Um, Fun fact about sharks. I had I was in Singapore where they had one whole dedicated show on sharks. It was a 360 degree view. Not 360, but it was a whole dome horizontally mm -hmm. placed where you could see this movie. And uh, they're showing how friendly sharks are and all these misconceptions that this the jaw movie has caused or so on. Yeah. Uh, but the I've... point which I wanted to make here was if this is a fun fact about sharks. If you flip it, it uh, stops moving. It uh, it just goes blank. I mean, yeah, that is uh, that is called tonic immobility. Um, so sharks are the most famous animals that do it, but actually a lot of animals do it. Uh, chickens do it. Uh, alligators do it. Um, rabbits, if you flip them up onto their back, they will do it as well. Um, 
it is a very interesting behavior that animals do. Um, baby humans also do it. If you lay a baby on their back, they might fall asleep. Um, but uh, that is essentially what it is. It is like telling the animal's brain to turn off all of a sudden. Um, we don't know exactly why they developed it. Um, it might be a response to predation uh, to allow the animal to relax in death instead of panicking and flailing around. Um, they might, it might be a way to cope with the trauma of death a little bit better. Um, we're not entirely sure why. Um, you know, in humans, there is this thing. Uh, I've heard stories of people who go on mountaineering and trekking. Once you get an accident, you break a bone or some huge thing happens. You don't feel the pain till a point. Like you can, you can drag yourself and go to some place, but the pain, I think it's the same way. You don't feel the pain. It's a survival thing, I believe. Yeah, that's uh, that goes into like going into shock and everything um, to to help help your brain kind of cope with that. Um, I had a pretty traumatic or injury maybe, in my back a few years ago, and that was not the case. It, it hurt the whole time. <laughs> so, or maybe you know what's the case with them is because they are they are so huge animal, or their evolution might not give have given them a chance to be flipped around like. Who, which other ocean creature is going to flip a shark? Yeah, maybe. And we do uh, see killer whales. We do see killer whales whenever they attack sharks. That's what they do is they flip them over on their back uh, and put them into this tonic immobility so they can oh. eat them without the shark fighting back. Uh, there's pictures of it online. It's really cool. Um, you'll literally see like a shark upside down in the whale, uh, the killer whale eating its liver. They go after their liver. That's the, the most nutritious part of the shark's body. Um, other movies i would recommend um there is a movie called the meg which is uh came out a few years ago it's another shark horror film but it's a little bit funnier than jaws um blue planet is not necessarily a movie it's a series i uh, i believe it's on at least in the u.s it's on netflix um but it is i've heard a about beautiful it, yes. series it's it's really really well done there's Blue Planet 1 and 2, they're both amazing. Um, and then the last one that I have is not strictly related to the ocean, um, but it is kind of related to marine biology. It's a movie called A Year on the Ice. Um, it's a documentary about living in Antarctica, uh, which Antarctica is very closely linked to the ocean that surrounds it. Uh, and so it's just about living on the base there. And so it's called A Year on the Ice. Um, mm -hmm. and it was done by this documentarian uh, to, who lives in New Zealand. The next question would be what, if you had to name two facts that fascinate you the most about ocean life, what would that be? Um, okay. So we already talked about how sharks give birth in three different ways. Uh, that is probably my favorite ocean fact. Um, so I've already given you that one. Uh, the other one that is this one's you kind have to of give two more so two, two more two uh, okay so um the other one one of the other ones uh is there is a type of octopus that lives in the ocean uh it has two different names uh it's either called the paper nautilus or the argonaut um i refer to it as an argonaut uh but if you look up paper nautilus you'll see it um the males and the females are very different from each other. Uh, the females, whenever they get pregnant, will lay their eggs. They actually make a shell. It looks kind of like a snail shell. Um, and that's what they have their eggs in. Um, they're the only octopus species that does this. Uh, what I think is more fascinating are the males. Um, the males... Is, is this what you're talking about? Give me just a second. So that is that is a chambered nautilus. Uh, look up here. I'll type the name. Uh, uh, there we go. Paper nautilus. Um, let's see here. If we scroll down a little bit, there might be some images of it. There we go. That's it. So you can see a little bit different from the last image, but these are uh, an octopus that make these eggs. So these are all pictures of female nautilus, uh, a female uh, paper nautilus. 
Uh, there's not many pictures of the males uh, because the males have very, very short lives. Uh, the thing that I think is so much fun about this is that male octopus, one of their tentacles is a, a very special organ and that it's called a, hec a hectocotylus. Uh, don't try to spell it out. Um, it is essentially, um, it's, it's what they have instead of a penis. Uh, they have this hectocotylus. Um, and so when it is time for them to breed, the males will fill their hectocotylus with sperm, and then they will rip it off of their body. And the, their hectocotylus goes swimming off into the ocean on its own. Um, doing this kills them. They literally die. Um, and so the reason this is my favorite fact is because for many, many years, people were finding what they thought was a sea slug swimming around in the ocean, and they couldn't figure out what exactly it was. That's a good picture of it right there. So they found this and they thought it was a type of sea slug. Um, and they couldn't figure out, they said, okay, we can see that it has tentacles. Um, it has, it, it, it has some sort of an injury on it, but there's no head. It's, a, it's swimming. It's acting like it's alive. It's reacting whenever you touch it. Uh, but it doesn't have a head. It doesn't have a digestive tract. Uh, we can't figure out how this thing is alive. And so essentially for many years, we were stealing this animal's last act uh, of penis. life. Uh, we were essentially stealing their, what they have for a penis. We were stealing it out of the water, thinking that it's some weird sea slug. Meanwhile, like the animal itself is already dead. And this was its last act to try to reproduce. <laughs> Um, so, but the, the hectocotylus swims how, off and finds a female and fertilizes her. How does this, uh, thing floating around with the head find a female? So it, um, it, it, we, we, we're not entirely sure of it. Um, the main idea is that, you know, it might be like they're close together and that maybe for some reason the current changes or, or something happens that the hectocotylus gets kind of swept away. Um, but I'm sure in some lab somewhere around the world, either in their archives or something, there is unknown sea slug labeled in a jar and it's just this hectocotylus <laughs> that's just sitting there. <laughs> um, so that is uh, a really great uh, fun fact that I love. Um, the an Another one that is really, really cool is shark teeth. Um, we didn't talk about shark teeth, um, but sharks uh, replace their teeth as they live. Um, they, don't, they don't need to go to a dentist. Uh, so a shark can go through anywhere between 10,000 to 40,000 teeth in a lifetime, uh, which is pretty incredible. Um, 10,000? So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 10,000 uh, teeth in a lifetime. Uh, so their teeth, the way that their jaws work is it's essentially a conveyor belt that constantly pushes old teeth out and new teeth in. So if you look up pictures of shark jaws, um, you can see how behind each tooth there are other teeth. And those are their new teeth that are getting ready to come into uh, the main part of the jaw. So I would say those are my, those are my two favorite facts about the ocean. I, I literally have a dentist appointment tomorrow. Um, and it'd be nice not to have to go to that. <laughs> yeah. Tell him I want a conveyor belt in my mouth. So I don't have to come to you again. Right. I, I mean, I guess there you go. That's a good picture. So that, uh, that looks like a Mako shark jaw and you can see how there's different teeth behind the teeth on the edge there's more teeth that are kind of tucked into the lower parts of the jaw and so those are teeth that are in the process of pushing their way out towards the front you know what's another cool fact about shark that i love they that they have to continuously keep moving to breathe so that is um that is a cool fact but it's not true for all sharks um 
So what you're talking about is what we call ram ventilation. Um, some sharks are capable of what we call uh, buccal pumping, where they can suck in water over their gills. Uh, so things like nurse sharks or carpet sharks, um, horn sharks, like uh, the middle image right there is a horn shark. That's a Port Jackson's this horn shark, it looks time. like. The middle this one, time. that's a kind of, the, the middle middle, there you go, yeah. Um, so yeah, that looks like a Port Jackson's uh, horn shark. Uh, they are capable of doing this buccal pumping where they can suck in water over their gills, uh, so this, they don't have this to. There's this fish which there's this fish we get in aquariums that keeps sucking the glass. Is that a shark or is that a relative to this? So that is, uh, it, I'm assuming what you're talking about is uh, a pleco. Um, they they go by a couple different names, but if you look up, uh, it's P L E C O. Um, yeah, pleco fish. Yeah, this one. That's it. So uh, sometimes called a sucker fish as well. So that is a species of fish that's actually native to South America in the Amazon River. Um, they they eat algae. Um, they're also sometimes called an armored catfish, and that's what they're related to. Are they're a member of the catfish family? Um, they just have this. Yeah, they get the name armored because their skin is very very tough. Um, it feels like a uh, uh, kind of bony plating. Um, and so they're very well protected against predators, uh, which is great for them because their belly is pretty soft uh, and that's their vulnerability. Uh, but because they eat you know, algae and everything, but they're not related to sharks other than being fish. <sighs> so these, uh, what do you say? Um... Whale shark had patterns like this on its back. So that's what I, this was the fish that I saw when I first saw whale shark. You know, this is very similar to the back of the whale shark. Yeah, they are the speckling. It? So that is, uh, that's just something that whale sharks have. They just have this speckling pattern on them. Mm -hmm. um, there is an idea that it might be a form of camouflage. Um, and so... This is what we call, yeah, I know. It doesn't what look like What the hell it. do they need to camouflage from? Well, because when, because whale sharks do start off in the world, not as 40 foot long fish, they start their life off as five foot long baby whale sharks. Um, and when they are that small, other things, other sharks will try to eat them. Uh, so this speckling pattern that they have is what we call disruptive coloration. Uh, so if you were deep, deep, deep down in the water, uh, they, the only part of them that would show would be the white spots uh, that you, if you were to look down, you would only see that. Or if the water is dark or muddy, you might only see the white spots and you wouldn't be able to tell exactly what it is. That's the idea behind it. It doesn't, for humans, it doesn't work very well. We can see it pretty clearly. Uh, but to a predator that maybe doesn't have the best eyesight, that might be all you need to defend yourself is just Absolutely. kind of kind of disrupt your image. Uh, tigers, actually, the reason that tigers have their stripes is it is another example of this disruptive coloration because tigers, even, they blend in really well. Even zebras, they yeah. blend into each other with those stripes. Absolutely. That's the whole the point of it. Is. Exactly. You can't tell how many zebras are, are in a herd of zebra or where one zebra ends and the other one begins. And that's that disruptive coloration we were talking about. When you want to sleep, you don't count sheep next time. You count zebras. Count some zebras. I like that. I'm going to try that next time. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Zach, uh, for amazing conversation and fun facts that we shared uh, we are approaching the end of the show. And as we have different fun activities after the, at the end, we are going to be creating uh, artwork with Zach. So Absolutely. thank you all for watching the show always and tuning in. We will uh, be posting links down how you can support the show. You can be a sponsor. You can be a patron. You can check out those kick-ass, badass artwork that I do. A lot of animations in there and I'm sure you'll enjoy. And do subscribe. Share this episode with your friends. Follow Zach for a most, such amazing content and let us know in the comment what else you would like to see next. All awesome. right. So let's dive into creating artwork. So this is the AI that I've opened up. It's called Dal-E. So Zach, what we'll have to do now is 
um imagine something so give me a just an imagination i'll try to put it in and um okay so i'll we'll try to improve it we've we've talked a lot about whales um let's let's talk a little bit about sharks um so when i was a kid i used to draw this image that was a shark wearing a top hat and a cane um almost like he's like very dapper um could we do something like that like a very well dressed shark shark wearing a hat and a wearing a hat maybe maybe give him a tuxedo um a pipe tuxedo pipe and uh uh what else um maybe there's some there's um there's a fish called a trumpet fish and another fish called a coronet fish which are like instruments um so mm-hmm. like maybe have maybe give him like a jazz band or something like he's like dancing on stage or something trumpet fish and uh a coronet fish and a pipe fish <laughs> There's also a fish called a drum, but they they don't look like they don't look like a drum that you would like bang on. They're just called drum. <laughs> so, uh, let's Oh, there's a guitar this. fish as well. I'm forgetting about guitar fish. <laughs> oh, guitar fish. Yeah, yeah, guitar fish, um which are actually really closely related to sharks. Uh they're in the ray family. And ray Rays is another topic uh, we'll cover. I got to see a ray. I was so surprised to see uh, when I had gone for scuba diving in Lakshadweep. So that's for another episode. That's awesome. <laughs> so rays are they pretty much are sharks. Um, the biggest difference is that instead of being tubular, they are laterally compressed. They're essentially a shark pancake, um, and. <laughs> they uh so, instead of eating fish mostly they eat crustaceans so their teeth instead of being sharp are very dull and are really good at crunching stuff what is a crustacean uh a crustacean is um they're a type of arthropod which arthropods are insects spiders crustaceans um crustacean literally means uh um hard thing in the sea uh whenever you hear shen crustacean um or cetacean which is what whales are called uh it literally means of the sea uh so that would be so, um so crustacean mm-hmm. they're just they're just underwater insects essentially <sighs> with without so giving from plankton yeah so they do Plankton's start off are not life, insects no sometimes sometimes they are um they many crustaceans start off their life cycle as a plankton uh and as they grow bigger if they don't get eaten by a whale or by a fish cuz pl- fish will eat plankton as well uh if they grow bigger uh then they metaf- metamorphose very similarly to how a caterpillar turns into a butterfly uh they go through multiple different stages as they grow oh, bigger I didn't and eventually know that. Yeah, absolutely. What's uh can you tell one of those names I'll put at a pull an image. Uh oh for like a like a a crab or something? Crustaceans that transform. Um look up here I'll I'll type it for you. Uh it is Napuli larvae. Okay so we'll come uh, back to okay just let's just complete this and then we'll go to dali again So Napuli. the 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 word napuli is a part of their life cycle um so uh, a butterfly my its caterpillar stage might have a different name from the butterfly itself um so napuli is essentially 
not the exact same thing, but it is the life cycle of many different species of crustacean. They have a napulae stage. Um, and so they usually have like one little tiny eye. So they're cyclopses. They only have one eye. Um, and is they this... can't really swim on their own. Um, I'm not seeing it. I just see Dolly right now. Oh, sweet. Hold on. Oops. Hmm. There it is. That's a really good example of a shrimp's life cycle. So you see how they start so off as a shrimp an egg. is a crustacean. Yes, yes, shrimp are crustaceans. Shrimp is absolutely. an insect. Uh, essentially, so insects are slightly different from crustaceans, but more or less they're they're underwater insects. Uh, just for okay. without going too deep into the taxonomy, more or less they're underwater insects. Uh, mm -hmm. So bugs. eggs, but you. Yeah, then, so you can see all the different life cycles that they move through on their way to being an adult shrimp. Um, all right. N most crustaceans have life cycles very similarly to this. Is it because they're very crusty and crunchy, crustaceans? <laughs> A little bit. So the, the whole name just comes <laughs> from their hard shell that they have. Uh, uh, all, all cru most crustaceans have a hard shell, uh, including barnacles, like who we talked about earlier. They have that hard outer shell. Mm -hmm. Or crabs. All right, back to, back to creating Zach's masterwork. Let's see here. So this, this is Dali, um, dapper shark wearing hat, tuxedo pipe, in a jazz band, playing, playing with trumpet fish, corn, cornet fish, pipe fish, guitar fish. Um, what style would you like to see this in? Oh, style. Uh... Like, do you want to see it as a photograph or a painting or any particular artist style that you mm. want it to represent or 3D? I'm, or a I'm actually, I'm actually a big fan of Salvador Dali, um, the, mm -hmm. the painter, um, which I feel like it's, even though it's spelled differently, I feel like it's appropriate that we're on Dali. Um, so Dali is spelled, uh, D-A-L-I, Dali. Okay. Are you ready? I'm, I'm ready, man. I don't know what's going to happen here. I'm excited for this. It's generating. I was going to say, that's not it. That's, those are cars. It's like futuristic, like spaceships and stuff. I've never oh, seen this loading. before. I saw, yeah. I saw the Dolly Mini last summer when it became, it got really popular here in the U.S. with people asking Dolly Mini to make stuff. Um, I know I did a few funny ones. Um but people were making like Shrek and SpongeBob and all, all sorts of crazy things. Um, but I've never seen the actual proper it's, dolly. Yeah, it's a lot of fun to create this as you'll see a lot of AI artists, NFT people uh, using this uh, tool to help them guide or improve their works or to compose. Wow. So these are the examples it is showing in the meanwhile, it is loading and doing yeah. the heavy lifting. Teddy bear on so a skateboard creates... in Times Square. Yeah. That looks, that's not a photograph though. No. That is an AI generated image. Yeah. So that's you can tell it in what style you want. If you tell wow. it, suppose in the next run, we'll do to make it as a photograph. So we'll try to create it as close as photograph as possible. It can do as well. Oh, this is your image. Wow. That's so cool. What a dapper shark. It gives you four options. Okay. So this is one. Two. Okay. He's playing three. like a... <laughs> That's great. So this is the guitar and the other things. What is this guy? What is this? Okay, that's our I, I don't know what they're going for. It looks kind of like a it looks kind of like a snake to me. 
Chameleon. Chameleon, I guess. What Maybe he's got, it looks like a cigar coming out of his mouth. I don't know. He's very <laughs> dapper. I like it. What do you call, what do you call a funny lizard? Oh, what do you call a funny lizard? A stand up chameleon. Oh, there you go. Hey, I got one for you. Uh, what do you call a, um, what do you call a, a lizard that doesn't work? Lazy lizard? A reptile dysfunction. Oh my god. <laughs> so, this is the fourth image of that. That's cool. This is so, so cool, not dude. S- so, which one of these you like the most? Um, I think number two or number three. I think number three is really cool because it's got a bunch of different things happening in it. This one? Um, there you go, that one. So it's it's got the shark playing the bass. It's got this other dapper guy on the left dancing around, looking real you know, happy. He's got a cane and everything. So now what we can do is we have got options now. Do you, okay. do you want to see variations of this? So we can do that. And also we can rephrase the thing. So let's just see the variations of this. First. Sure. A Vincent Van Gogh style playing. This is so cool, dude. I've never seen this before. <sighs> so do yeah, you, you can play around with this. Do you have to have a subscription to this? Is this um, like a service no. that you pay to, to use? Uh, it is free for a couple of runs per month. They give you credits. And then if you are like extensive user, then you pay. But uh, it's like... It's fun. It's not, um, what do you say? It's free, basically. You have to apply to them and then they give approval on the mail. But it happens very easily. Wow. So these are the three variations it created. Okay. Oh. Let's see here. <laughs> I like coming this up out of the water. Of yeah. It looks like his guitar broke and part of it's coming out of his neck. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this one is cool. Oh, that's there the like best two one. Of them. That's the best one. It's a it's a, a, a duo song and dance. That's the there's best other one fishes here, there. right? Yeah. Are these fishes close to the other fishes you described? Um. So the one at the top, um, that's like right in between the two dapper sharks, um, in the middle. He that looks very similar to a guitar fish. Um, but not quite exactly. Um, it looks like a guitar fish kind of swimming by. Um, the other uh-huh. two look just like more generic fish. The bottom one that's down to the lower left-hand side uh, looks kind of like a cod, um, which is a really popular fish to eat here in the U.S. Um, it looks very similar to a cod. Oh, there we go. Let's see This here. is the uh, last one. I don't know if I like this one as much, but it's still really cool. How this one is the best. I think, I think this one's the best. I think. Do this you want to see more variation of this? Uh, uh, sh- sure, let's do it. <laughs> okay, one last time. So it it creates three wow. D renders also three D looking objects. That's wild, and this is all done through an AI imaging process. Yeah. So, so I sometimes, I sometimes use an AI through a program database. to edit photos. Oh, this has become better, even better now. Yeah. Yeah, the fish you looks can like see this clown clownfish. Fish. Uh-huh. It's definitely a clownfish. The shark that's got the guitar has a pipe in his mouth. He actually has what looks like a pipe fish. Yep, the and little this, pink pipe Like fish. the expression, the smiles and the singing expressions are also better in this. Yeah. They um, <laughs> they look like they've got human teeth. <laughs> <sighs> oh, this one. That one's great. <laughs> We're kind of moving away from sharks a little bit, but uh, I love the expressions. They're very emotional. So, this one. I love. And I love this. this one. Man, all of these are great. Um. 
I think number two, number two with the really great smile, but all of them have like really that one right there. So this <laughs> one or this one? Choose one. Uh, I think that one, this one right here, just because I love this their one? expression so much. Yeah. This one, right? The one yeah. on the screen right now. Right. Yeah. This one. Or this one. The other one. This one. Yeah. Yeah. Because it has a hat also, and the yeah, he has the hat. The they both have like like a ukulele or a guitar. There's other fish hanging out with them. I think this is. I think this is the winner. Let's go. We created a live art on the space on the podcast today. <sighs> that's awesome. This is so, so cool. That's... Thank you for sharing this with me. So I'm going to download this and send it to you, and it'll also be uh, probably a thumbnail. Uh, Thank you. Of this podcast, yeah. <laughs> um, Here, I'm gonna and... I'm gonna take a I'm gonna take a screenshot of us real quick while we're doing this, uh, and I'll post this on my Instagram today. <laughs> So here, smile. Oh, hang on. Smile big. There we go. All right. So uh, one more thing you want to see is, so that's the challenge, you know. Uh, that's the challenge of uh, AI art because you will have to keep creating and trying out different variations and all that. So you, it takes time there. So to decide which one to go for and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, so if you try again, um, so if you, you can go back, same, uh, use the same prompt and try to do it in 3d or some other, other ways like that. So it's a lot of fun, all the animals, chimpanzees, and you have so much data in your mind of imagination. You can all mm -hmm. put that there and see what all comes out. It, it's a fun activity to do. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I know what I'm going to do with my afternoon now. I'm going to be playing with this with this, just to mess around with it because I had so much fun with the, the miniature version of this AI that came out this past summer asking it to create really dumb images. Um, like I had one of like it was SpongeBob on trail cam footage, uh, which trail mm -hmm. cam footage always looks really creepy. It just <laughs> looks like SpongeBob so running around the woods. Uh, thank you so much, Jack, once again, for being the part of the show. You are an amazing person, really enjoyed your vibes and the fun and the fun facts you shared with us. And yeah, I'm definitely uh, see uh, subscribing to all your posts and looking forward to see more videos that come out. They're really good. I mean, a talent hunter should reach you very quickly with that. Thanks. I mean, this is a really good quality because I've been seeing a lot of videos and documentaries. So I know what I'm talking about. Zach creates some good stuff, guys. Check it out. I appreciate it. Tammy, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I'm looking forward to it. This was an absolute blast. Thank you so much for having me on.